Hello, hello, hello. Howdy, everybody. We're live. Wednesday, Wednesday. Thursday for some of you. Pete says sweet. Yeah, I hear you, my friend. Uh, what do we got here? Mediocre middle-aged modeler says good evening, everybody. Zal, 6 a.m. Monday morning or whatever it is, Thursday morning. Darren, good morning uh, from Brisbane as well. All my Pacific Rim people are up bright and early today. Panzer Dan, hey buddy. Quantum plastic. <laughs> I'm just gonna say hello. <clears throat> uh, you guys are speaking in uh, your dialect. Somebody's a little angry out there. Uh, Mike says he got that package out today. Thank you, bud. I appreciate that. I'll uh, I'll let you know when it comes in. And then what do we got here? Lewis says hello, Mike from Puerto Rico. John Fosley says good evening, guys. Andrew Thatcher, hello. TJ, what's up, buddy? Uh, Colian Detlev from Berlin, hello. Guten Nacht. And uh, good morning to you, Mike. How are you, Mr. Nog in the Noggin? <laughs> it's not that early. Yeah, it is. Well, no, for you, it's probably what? I'm gonna get, am I got this right? Is it 10 a.m. or 9 a.m.? Greetings from DC. Hello, Pete. Good to see you again. Where's the lovely 6 p.m. there and 6.01 in uh, East Coast. Yep, it's Wednesday. It's about to piss rain. Dark, cloudy skies behind me there. You can all see those. Yeah, it's a uh, shame you're not on Twitch where you could just see how much you earn. <laughs> Is that a thing? It's not a lot. The way this is set up, this is a, this YouTube streaming, the, the YouTube, the Patreons wait making a lot more than this. That's for sure. Don't know why that's a thing. Uh, Jason Gillius, hello, Mr. Dallas. How are you, buddy? You're gonna have a good year, aren't you? It's eleven. Okay, so it's, it's it's one more hour. It's always you're always one further over than I think. Rick says, "Happy fall afternoon." It be that, my friends. The leaves are turning out there. We got yellows, reds, oranges. It is, it is coming fast. Have you noticed too? The sun is like literally setting, like over, over uh, OHSU now. It's like way down there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's midnight in Germany. Yep, and it's 11, I think, in London. Uh, I'm gonna guess Moscow is really early. Um, Sanova says greetings from Virginia. Hello, Vivian. Um, I know some of you in chat are Joe. Hello, I see you. You're back from Chicago and 10 pound heavy. Yeah, that's usually how that goes. Chicago is a food city, not for the not for the healthy kind. <laughs> Dennis says, "All aboard!" Hey, what's up, bud? How are you, man? Um, yeah, what else we got? Yeah, if those of you waiting for books that are supposed to be on their way, uh, I'm told they're going out to all this week. Uh, something happened with that whole email thing, and they're claiming. <laughs> They didn't get my orders or whatever in the last two days. I've been going back and forth with my shipper and I'm like, well, it doesn't have anything to do with my emails. So I don't know what's going on. Um, anyway, uh, we'll get that sorted out. I don't have the best luck with fulfillment. In fact, the best shipping I ever did was when basically I do it. <laughs> and it's, you know, I'm too old for that now. So I apologize. Third party services when you're when you're purchasing uh, other people's time is, is, a, is a difficult conversation. Uh, Dan Dino says, if the dust uh, don't get to the acid, will. <laughs> Good day to all. Minneapolis says, model up. You got a 40 foot. Uh, Doug's Bass Place says, yeah, that's just what I need thinks. You're welcome. Yeah, you all can thank TJ on this one. I was, uh, I'm kind of in between, as, as I've said before, I'm in between a few things. We're in this kind of middle ground now where, where things are coming or going and coming in and I'm like this and I'm like, what am I going to do today and that whole thing. And he was asking a question about something. Or he posted something about what he was doing. I'm like, you know, that's not a bad one because I get other questions on what TJ was doing uh, regarding dust, like all the time. So dust is is one of those common ones to uh, to address, which I'm fine, fine, fine to uh, to do again. Happy to. In fact, I've got enough pieces here. Uh, we can have a pretty solid stream just on doing pigment dusting. Not any kind of like real mud effects or anything like that. Mostly just pure dust. We can do stuff on, on this. I've never did the, I did this side way back when. Uh, I'm just going to use this as a sample just to just to throw some stuff down. Kind of a warm up. Um, we're going to redust some of the treads on this tire that we did back in the tires and track stream. And then I've got this little guy 
Um, we might do some pencil work on this uh, to, to keep going. And then I've got the T34 and the Hetzer still. Um, so. Zell's having issues. <laughs> Um, what else we got? Then if that's still fighting you, Zal, just, just prime and paint it, dude. Don't worry about it. Just prime and paint it. Don't, don't fight a battle you don't need to fight. You can always do the bare plastic thing later, or the, the clear plastic later. That just sounds like it's an old model, whatever it was, whatever's going on, it just got issues. I have that problem too, um, where I had to seal the, the gun, the, the, the bazooka thingy. It just was, sometimes they fight you and you know what dude, don't fight that battle, just switch, switch it up. Sacraman, hello from the UK, how are you? How's your night going? Uh, probably a combination of both, Mike. Joe probably had all, had all the above. He had the Chicago pizza and the, and the beef sandwiches. Oh, Mike, yeah, I know, you always want the dust stream. You guys in the dark schemes, let's see what else. <clears throat> Matt58, hello, how are you? Michael Weiss, what's up bud? How are you, man? Derek's Lights and Crafts. He also says hello. Everybody's so friendly today. <laughs> I'm having a good day, Sacrament. Not too bad. Slept well. Uh, we're doing proofs with a printer, so that's always a good stage. Uh, three books in the proofing stage is, is um, that means something's happening. <laughs> that means, woo, we're doing good. Finally, um, we have enough paper and enough uh, cover stock to, to do five books right now. By the time those are done, the next round of paper delivery should be here, so we should be able to do the next uh, four books after that, which means we're pretty much caught up. So that's that's we're we're knocking on the door of getting caught up here with the pre-orders, which is going to be a huge relief. I might take some time off. <laughs> I might just relax and just go have a margarita somewhere. Uh, what else? Yeah, yeah. What else we got? Matt says, hit that like button. Yes, that's a please and a thank you. Uh, Zal confession just at a sludge wash on the 72 Vosper boat. Yeah, it's a big that's a big thing It's a nice kit. It's well, it's, I don't want to say it's a nice kit. It's not a bad kit. It's an ancient kit uh, But it was back when when Tamiya was doing really good stuff from um, Just in general like it's just a good kit even though it's pr probably pretty simple uh, Raphael says he's got some time to stream. How's school going Raphael? Probably just getting started right early semester Pete says uh, sweet Mike. Thanks. I'm waiting for this one. Yep. You're welcome. Um, I'm a one-man business machine. That is a fair assessment, mediocre. That is a fair assessment. Hugo, hello from Melbourne. Nice. Got some Aussies. Got some Kiwis. Uh, we got Omnipla from Seoul, South Korea. Nice. Uh, Master Pigments. You can learn this too. Uh, yeah, we'll go through some pigment stuff today. I'll rehash for you guys um, on the colors I use. Uh, we'll go through. I've got my light, medium, and dark stashes here. Got those here right in front of me. I've got my X20A thinner. I've got some, is everything, everything's a Tamiya. Well, I do have some mission models, so I do have some mission models thinner as well. I've got some oil paints for the dusting. We've got a very fresh, bright, happy new palette today. Um, so Mr. John uh, Fozzi in the, in the, in the chat, um, we're gonna give the refrigerator a go. We're gonna see how long we can make this palette go. I've put every m major color I need for the next Two weeks and we'll see if I can work this one one guy here we'll see how it goes usually I give up on those because I, I tend to mix them all so much sometimes I just go through them and, and half the colors get used up and the other half don't so I just pitch in and get another one Paul hello there you are uh, what else we got Dominic lots of doms excuse me oh what is it Mike on the panzers with their small lift yeah I read that I was trying to figure out what you're talking about uh, on the lifting, you're talking that little, that little, that little like finger hook thingy there on the edge of the turret that's kind of reversed downward, so they hook onto it and lift the turret off the thing for service. Um, holding them to clean the seam lines. Do it on the sprue. So I, if I'm correct, the the sprue nub gate connects to where the um, the little mount on that the peg mount is on that piece, like that goes that goes into the model. Um, you should have access to that part. Just sand that all while it's still on the sprue, and then you should be able to trim that off because I'm pretty sure. They didn't put the sprue gate on the edge of that hook, if I remember that correctly. Um, if not, I suggest uh, maybe some double side tape, something like that. Um, you actually might even be able to, believe it or not, uh, the little trick is I don't, I don't have anything here in front of me, but 
You could jam part of that into the car into like a piece of cardboard so it holds it, and then you could, you should be able to gently sand or, or or knife scrape that edge without putting it in tweezers and flying off like what you're talking about. Um, so we bought that as a, but it sucks. Yeah, that's it. I was gonna say the the, the to me a, what which one is it? Would you say it was the, the Vosper? Yeah, the Vosper boat, the torpedo boat thingy. Probably from the late 70s, early 80s, maybe. I forget when that came out. It's not, it's probably older than most, some of the, some of the guys in chat. Uh, Fan Carello says, Bonsoir from Paris countryside. Bonsoir, amigo. <laughs> I always say that. I always go amigo. It's from LA. Bonsoir, mon ami. There you go. That's probably more accurate. Um, let's see. Universe started a week ago. I'm already for it. Yeah, I'd imagine. Uh, what else we got? Keep in mind after one even current to transfer the paint to. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I, I probably won't. I don't have any little piece of glass uh, thingies for that. Yeah, Vosper 74. That's what I thought. I knew it was pretty old. But that's from the generation of the, the KB1s, the KB2s, the original T3476 they did. Uh, those toolings are all pretty good still. Like, you can get away with them. Um, the Panzer 2s, Panzer 3s. I think there's a Sturmgeschütz 4. The early older Tiger, the older Panthers, Panther A, I think it was. Uh, those are all shitty models. Uh, stay away from. But the Vosper boat, you can still do. You can still do a lot of work with it. Yeah, it was expensive. I've never built one, but I'm familiar enough with it. Yeah, most a lot of stuff was motorized back then too. I think a lot of the kits were motor armor and all their stuff's motorized at some degree. Um, some dude on Instagram, beers and sprues or sprues and beers or whatever, um, did the motorized World War One tank. Was it the Mark IV or whatever it was? I forget, or whatever kit they did. He's kind of putzing along his Instagram. It's, yeah, they still motorize shit. They still sell you the 35th scale RC versions of the, of the regular tanks that they do. So they're, they're into it. But that's their thing is, is RC. To me, it makes their money from RC, not from plastic models. Well, what else we got? Okay, I'm good. It looks like my, it's so dark in here now. It's so cloudy and it's a pissing rain out there now. Okay, what a Panzer Death says, I'm have to build T3045 and an EZ8 using the same green and see where the OPR can take them. Go, brother. Go for it. Nothing like experience. Uh, let's see. Great question. I wanted to ask the same. I lost the lifting hook off a of Panzer 1 last night while trying to sand it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is sand it while it's on the turret, too. Put the thing on and, and sand it. I've, it's been a while since I built a Panzer 1. Probably 10 years. So I'm trying to remember the... the I'm guessing it's just a little little slot and then that little jimmy rig goes in and you probably just sand on the thing man i don't know, I don't know. just don't lose them <laughs> don't look at me dude shit's flying off your thing let's get you a little meat gorilla hooks not my fault blame blames out for that okay little white dollar ties yeah oh smepo yeah i never get to home depot dude i just there's no reason for me to have glass style that's why i don't <laughs> i've never done that but I did, I did notice when I put it in, um, I put it in the Tupperware and I put that in the fridge um, that when it, it seemed to, within the weeks of time, about a one week of time, it was fine. So the, the pallet I put in was fairly well used to, be, to start with though. But if I get two weeks, I probably, we'll see if I can get that. That's not a big deal to me. Uh, uh, yeah, I think so. 130, 135th was it to me a scale. So 76 and 70 and 30 seconds. So that's what it was, was the original scales were 76 and 30 seconds because they're half of each other, if I remember. That's back in the 60s-ish, Airfix, Matchbox, those dudes. Uh, Carney. <laughs> Either way, none of, neither way is good. <laughs> uh, Colleen Detlev, is the Hetcher the same model you've unfinished? Is, uh, yeah, probably. If, if it's the same, if I did the Hetcher there, model by Koenig, did I have the Hetzer with me there? I thought I did the mouse at, at, at MBK. Oh, Detlev, I thought that was the... Um... Is this Detlev, Detlev? Is this big Detlev? Is this my boy? Is that is that who it is? Is that who I'm talking to? If it is, hello, my friend. It's been many years, been years. Um, any tips of prolonging life to see a glue? I think the, the cool refrigerator does the same thing. Um, it has a shelf life. So um, there's a few chemicals, in fact, I was I was uh, I was talking to a friend about that specific subject, Zal, and it was um, I recently purchased like last at the grocery store like last week uh, in the brand the United States Gorilla Glue, their super glue gel, and it has like the blue cap. It's really nice looking, whatever. Opened up, solid. <laughs> it's like God damn it. So yeah, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. Patrick Stout, hello, bud. How are you? Yep. 
that love okay sweet okay great yeah yeah i if i if i brought this one with me if it's if this is the one then you probably saw like like that much you know that little bit the back end but yes it's the only hatcher i've worked on <laughs> so we're gonna go with the answer is yes <laughs> to that question now, a few more questions any answer anything like that 315 we'll roll in about five minutes we'll get going here We'll get going. We'll do some stuff. We'll be busy. Oh, what else we got? Robert from Poland. How are you, buddy? Off topic. How's the food scene in Portland? Are you kidding me, Joe? Do you not know what the food scene in Portland is all about? We were just named the best pizza city in America, number one. Let's just start off with that comment. That blew me away. I was like, holy shit. Now, it's true, though. I can confirm. But I was surprised to hear that anyway, because there's some serious pizza in this country. So, yeah, Portland food scene is as good as it gets. There's, you know, it can compete with any city except probably New York or San Francisco for the high-end stuff, but um, yeah, Portland is money. Um, yeah, I usually throw away <laughs> my CA glues. I just buy the glues at the store now. That that glue, I don't even, I don't buy the, um, well, shit, what was the, Zappagap. I used to buy Zappagap all the time. Well, we used to have brick and mortar stores all the time too. <laughs> Y'all remember those days. We don't have any brick and mortar stores in, in the Pacific Northwest. There's a few. Um, they're up in Vancouver that way. Uh, what's his name owns them? There's like, I think there's like three hobby towns north of me, uh, but they're just far enough away that, that I don't, you know, the internet does me fine. I'm, I'm good. Dan uh, did not. <laughs> Awful tanks made for much more interesting models. Yeah. Uh, what else do we got? Uh, Schubert Sebastian says, can you hit, can you tint the MM clear primer with any of the paints for custom primer? Yes, you can tint it. It won't be as potent as you think. I would probably um, start with one of the colored primers, um, but yeah, you can tint it. I haven't, I haven't really explored that too, too much, but yes, you can. It's all, it, it all works together. Uh, Yankees out, go Redbirds. Yeah, I was a little bit, I mean, that's, that's, you know, my own teams have their own problems right now, Joe, so I feel bad for the Yankees, but, but it's going to be if, um, yeah, well, I mean, I still have the Dodgers for baseball. I got my Dodgers. My boy Blues are in. Um, but yeah, what else we got? I don't know if I answered that question on the sand in the seams on the little mini tow hooks. But if I did, you were, I hope I did. Uh, what else we got? Okay. Everybody ready? Do you have a favorite tank art? No. That's like asking a parent, do you have a favorite child? We can't tell you that. That's against the rules. <laughs> um, it's usually... usually um, I mean, Tank Art One's a seminal book because it's the one that started it all. It's the one that sold the most and all that kind of stuff. So I mean, there's, 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 there's that conversation. I think as far as like the quality of the book goes and the information, Tank Art Four, um, and then Tank Art. But see, they all they all have their strengths. So to me, is is Tank Art Two, uh, its longevity. You know, that was the book that saved the company, if you if you will. Like we we printed. Um, sizable numbers for for all the German stuff, but I, we printed double the number of the Ally book. And, and it sold almost 10,000 copies over like five or six years. And it was that sustained sales that when I went to China and tried to print more stuff and we were hurt and tank our two sales were steady enough that we kept afloat. So there's, they all have their like, you know, moments for me. This is just like your kids, man. <laughs> you know, but then there's the SM books too. And I, you know, I haven't really pushed the SM books hard yet, but I think when, when you see the next three books from, from that series, uh, and what they actually do, you know, they're my favorite, to be honest with you. The tank art books are beasts. They're like they're like kids in high school. They're just a mess, you know. They're just like just endless. But the SM books are really clear, really defined. Uh, they're really expressive when you get into them. You really put some time into them. <laughs> I buy Zappagap because Paul buds busted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were, we've been using Zappagap for for 20, 30 years, so. Um, yeah, Detlev, I would say you should be able to finish a Hetzer pretty fast. Uh, what I did was I, I had used that for Mosin in 2017. That's when I built it. I took it over there. I did the first demos on the back of the Hetzer. Uh, I probably brought it with me to showcase. Um, and I think probably what I did is I think I did the roof maybe, now that I'm thinking about it. If I remember, I did the top panel, the roof. Um, and then I had planned, I got the frill model tracks for it and everything else, I planned to just build the model out and finish it. And then it just sat because I had so much other stuff coming in and going. And so that's just, and then for these things, when this started up, you know, the, the heads are sitting there in the closet. And I'm like, well, why not? Made it made a good test subject. And I did some other varnish testing on it too, just to see some stuff. So it's, it, it'll get its whole thing. 
That's TJ, just because you do mostly allied. That's why it's your favorite. Just, that's what that is. It's green. It's full of green tanks. Um, any Hesper, Hetzer experts here? The difference between mid and late? It's it's just the details of the exhaust, the idler sprocket, um, the fittings on the on the on the um, on the fenders. Uh, I think they re they changed some of the order of the fitments on the on the fenders. Uh, it's mostly an exhaust change visually, uh, and then the 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 drive sprocket idler wheels are updated throughout the production run. Um, yeah, it's not much. There's very subtle differences, and I think we call them early, mid, late than than the real tanks actually were truly early, mid, lates. So, all right, let's get going. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Again, I don't know how they crewed Hetzers. I've seen I've seen the Hetzer in, in Munster, and it's it's. <laughs> yeah, dude, I don't know. Uh, that must have been it must have been the little dudes in that one because that's a, that's a very tight. And the Stugs aren't big either, but the Hetzers like hello. Because it's it's the taper of the hole. It's like a teepee. So anyway, all right. Let's start with the, uh, the real thing here. Give some uh, little props. Let me push the keyboard out of the way. Everybody good? Every other questions? Any other little questions before we get rolling? This will be a pretty straightforward day. Do not fall. <laughs> okay, one difference was was uh, one difference would be how the red oxide paint undercoat looks. Same as quite quite dull. Some is very bright. Um, so Dan, on your comment there on that, um, I would actually recommend um, grabbing a pink primer. Uh, the red primers that are true to tone are very are quite dark. And, and I have noticed that. And, and one thing is if you want a little bit more visible brightness to your top color, especially a Dunkelgeld, put some pink primer in that red primer or lighten the red primer up with white so it's kind of more of a pink primer color. It'll give that yellow just a little bit more pop, visual pop to it. Uh, sexy, 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 and I don't even know how to say that. <laughs> Saxonian, there you go. Uh, evening, you're the reason airlines are getting curious about all those King Art brushes getting flown over the UK. I hope so. I hope so. That's that's good. I don't. I haven't checked the stock levels lately of the King Art brushes, the uh, the Golden Taclon series. Um, I'm guessing they're still low, or if they're probably still sold out. Um, links are in the description down below. <laughs> Doing my duties. Yeah, these guys, original golds. Well, that's not. That's the flat one, but. Let's go over here. Do I got everything? I feel like I got everything. I'm gonna get one out of here. Let me get my little mug off screen. Nice bright light for you guys on a very, very dark, gloomy, rainy day. Okay. Okay, let me start with a quick recap on this just because I know it's it's always good to refresh these. So I keep my pigment. We'll start with pigments um, and we'll blend in some oils. We'll, we'll do a combination of dry pigments. Uh, we'll do the, the airbrush fixer. So this is going to be a dust stream. It's not going to, even though we can, we can probably do some regular application dry mud if I want to, but I'm probably going to focus on dust today. Um, I've got the T34, the Hetzer, the turret. If we need to do some more, the turret might be used for, for another process today. Hopefully we get to it. I'll get a little bit of this and we'll do some, some dusting with oils. So we'll go back and forth a little bit. Oh, I've got some, we'll dust some tracks up too. What else? Okay. So what I like to do is light, medium, and dark, and, I've, and you guys all know this probably by now. Um, so what I do is I put in, um, start with five or six colors. So what you're probably seeing in here is a combination of like a light European earth. And I'll use, most of these names will be like the, the Spanish, uh, weathering company names they use kind of a similar vernacular uh, of nomenclature so it's it's kind of a, a light european dust the beach sand um, anything like a light dust anything like a i think there's a light copper dust it even has got a little greenish hue to it i think i put some in here there's even some white in here uh, to lighten it up even more um, and then uh, whatever other tones there's i'm trying to think off the top of my head uh, my, my MIG production bottles are sold. All those little sticker caps of the names have come off. So I've had them for, I don't know, almost 14, 15 years. 
So pigments are, the beauty of pigments and the beauty of doing them this way is that they, it extends the life of the product, each bottle. Uh, and then the main advantage of this, the main reason I do this, if you're unfamiliar, if you're new to the stream or the books or whatever, um, the main reason I'm doing this is that it creates a ton of depth out of this bottle straight onto the model uh, versus putting on multiple colors yourself over time. So putting all the colors in here, it's kind of a loose dry mix. I just put the cap on and shake it. Uh, then what I do with the light one is I, I take a good portion, I throw it into the medium. And then I'll take some of the some of the little bit richer, darker tones. These two are actually fairly close. You can see they're actually, they're probably too close in reality. Uh, I keep trying to darken the medium up a little bit more um, over time. Because what happens is, is, this, is as these get depleted, the medium probably goes the fastest. It's like the most used of the colorways because it's kind of that general usage color. So it's really nice for a lot of other things just besides dust. Um, but anyway, it's you've got your five or six out of this guy. You pour some into this dude. Uh, and then instead of like a light European does, I switch to like, I think European dirt, uh, just a touch of Russian earth because it's kind of a darker olive greenish color. Um, or at least the original bottle I had was, I think they changed that color in production actually to way more dark brown. But just add some more of the middle range tones. Uh, and like I've said before, especially like with the oil paints and the pigment colors, there's only about 24 to 30 available. So there, it's not like you have 200 to choose from and you need to know like, hey, you know, just Every time you put an order in for something, the truth be told is the best way to just keep grabbing a couple of, and, and throw them in your order every time to build up your library. Because these will last a very, very long time. I, these are, I'm still in the originals. Uh, and then in the dark, what I do is I take some of that medium and I dump it in here and then I add the darkest of the tones I have to blend this up, including some black smoke. So there's black smoke in this, there's that uh, rail tie brown dirt, that, that rusty rail color they call it, or rail brown or whatever they call it. Anything of that nature is like a really dark, rich red brown dark it's darker than the rust tones. I don't put most, I, I try to avoid rust tones in my pigments. I keep those separated. And the reason is that rusty orange coloring in your pigments will make all your dirt look orange. And so I just don't do it. Same with the Vietnam stuff. I rarely don't put in any of the harsh red Vietnam earth or anything like that. I avoid those conversations. I try usually to stick to um, the industrial earth, the industrial dust. Those are the grayer tones and you mix those with the tan tones and that's how you get that kind of you get this kind of the gray, gray, tan, dusty colorway for your for a lot of the colors that we use, which is Panzer Grays, Forbio, Olive Drab, you know, red browns and, 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 and red greens. So that's the basic breakdown of that. That's and I just pour them in there. They keep them in there. The lids of these little 35 mil containers keep them going. Uh, Robert, you can mix from different producers for sure. Uh, just you want to probably confirm that they're all like an acrylic pigment, which I'm pretty sure they are. So you can put a Vallejo and a Life Color with the AK, the Ammo, and the MIGs. Like those should all play together. I'm pretty sure. Uh, to me, I don't know if to me it makes powder pigments. I, I don't know. Maybe I heard that, or maybe it's coming. I'm not sure. But they, I probably wouldn't use the Tamiya stuff with any of these things. But any of the Spanish brand companies that, that make a pigment, or the Italian, the European brands, uh, they're almost all an acrylic uh, pigment. Don't quote me on it. I'm pretty sure they are. I'd be surprised if they're using an enamel pigment at all. I, I'd be stunned. Yeah, the 502, so my original 502 Russian Earth is like a dark olive green. It's like the industrial earth in the oil paint. Where is it? It's right here. Um, industrial earth, Russian earth are two tones that are basically a really dark olive drab. Now I did get a, I went through Russian earth pretty fast. Once I do remember this is kind of old school memory. That so might be hazy. There was like a darker brown version or they shifted color, something happened. And that, that's not uncommon. Sometimes manufacturers will, will shift recipes without telling the, 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 the private brand label. That happens often, <laughs> by the way. That can happen. Because we've seen some color shifts even with Tamiya and some of their stuff. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't sure. But any anything from the Japanese companies, I don't think any of them make a dry pigment. But all the Spanish companies and Italian companies, you should be able to put to blend those together, Robert. Which is a good question because I know most of you have multiple brands. I know AK and Ammo are compatible and then 502 slash AK and Ammo, those three should be completely compatible. And I think the Vallejo makes a lot of pigments and Life Color does. They should all be fairly compatible. So the only the only thing with pigments is is the really crucial thing for me is, or to explain, is the use of, the, the, of a liquid fixer and then what the reasons are for what fixer choices we're making. Um, I know they all like to sell their own fixers, um, which is fine. It's, you know, I have a bottle of the stuff just for the, I use it for the stronger stuff. But oftentimes their fixers uh, have 
other chemicals in it, like like the I do believe uh, if I'm if I again I think I've said it before, the stuff here it's repackaged and rebranded by a few different companies. It's all basically the same stuff. Uh, this stuff here, there's like a gloss varnish in this. Uh, it says flat finish stuff. <laughs> yeah, bro, I'll call you out on that one. Um, but I and maybe the newer ones, but I, I think some of them that have dedicated fixers, they have a, a binding component intention, you know, designed for strength, which is, that's when I use it the most. So I, I don't use it for this process today. So what I use or what I try to use is I try to use, um, because they're acrylic pigments is I try to use an acrylic thinner and then that binds to the acrylic base coats. That's the whole purpose of it. It's kind of like a soft gluing effect, if you will. I've explained this a little bit before. So in other words, if you have enamel thinners and you're using acrylic pigments on an acrylic base coat, it's probably not. And that's why I've always confused when they started pushing that around. I, I've seen some guys talk about that. But if you've got a humbral base coat, that makes sense. But for me, I'm almost all acrylics, acrylic lacquer, so I always use this one instead. Um, but I also like that there's a little bit of glycerin in this and then how this kind of dries comparatively, how, how this product in particular evaporates out. I don't like how fast enamel thinners evaporate out. It doesn't bind. It. Well, I've tried it before in the old days, um, but I was using, um, you know, like a, AK's White Spirits. I'm trying to think of, the, they have like a nitro thinner and some other stuff. I didn't really like it, to be honest with you. So I just stuck with acrylic thinners. Uh, and then when I use like, say for example, when I switch to mission models, paint jobs and stuff, when I do that, I have, I just use their thinner. So that's how that process, I keep it real simple. I don't get super crazy with my stuff. But let me get some questions out there. Ironically, Photoshop's don't want to recycle the 35 mil. You know, you can hop on eBay. Uh, you can buy, you can buy bags of these, like a bag of 10 or a box of 10 and 35 mil. They're all over eBay still. Uh, in fact, I looked the other day, I was going to buy like a box of 20 fresh ones just to have, just to have. Cause I'm all like, well, they're going to disappear eventually, but yeah. So you just hop on eBay and you should be able to find 35 mil containers. No, the film containers, no problem. Um, what else do we got? No, uh, VMS has some pretty decent pigments. Yeah, I've not used so, so VMS is new to me in terms of when it came out, what, a few years ago, four or five years ago, it's a Polish company, correct? Um, it's not very common in the United States. Um, not that the internet doesn't de defeat that purpose, but uh, I just never really pursued, you know, looking into it or anything like that. Uh, I probably should. I, again, I still need to get the precision. I just know I haven't even done that. Um, so I'm kind of lazy with that stuff. No, Zal, it doesn't. So, so what I do, um, and I talk about this in the book too. This is, again, some of these questions are you guys read the books. <laughs> Buy the books, read the books. No, the truth is what I do. So with each project, when I, so I'm showing you demo work, but with each real project, like when I'm got the serious hat on, uh, I adjust the colors before I start. So what I'll do is I'll go in, okay, or I'll look at that, okay, well, last time that tone was was kind of a warm tan color and I'll put in some more grays and whatever to, to gray that out for the next project or whatever I'm doing. I adjust these colors for each model, to be truthful. And you can see the difference too. You'll you'll see the difference over time. So yes, I do adjust them for a thing. For demo work, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I don't worry about it. Because when I get down to doing a real project, again, it's, and this is what makes them so beautiful. I just throw in a few colors that I, that I wanna shift it to and then I just go that way. Because like, for example, beach sand is, as like a, a yellowy, uh, creamy yellow, pale. Actually, beach sand looks almost identical to this. So I'll so say, for example, this was like industrial dirt is like a real gray color. Then I'll throw the beach sand in that and shift the tone. So that's, that's what I tend to do with that stuff, yeah. <clears throat> what else we got? Uh, brushes are in stock and there's a 40% 40, uh, 40 off coupon at King Art. Sweet, 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 there you go. There's your latest, greatest. So they probably restocked them because it's been how long since we talked about that? Maybe two, three weeks. So that's plenty of time for them to to, re, to reboost that. So if you if you're short on brushes or want to get brushes now, uh, it sounds like the number twos uh, from what Panzer Dan just said is they're in stock at King Art, and the links in the description. Um, and I think all you have to do is I've got the name of that brush listed out, so you can just cut and paste and put that in the search window. And it should pop it right up in there on their website. Uh, let's see what else we got. So that kind of covers the basics of the pigments. We're gonna to stick to the light and medium mostly for today. Um, and then, so the last part of this conversation is your airbrush. I think my, I've got my, so I have the Mac valves. Yeah, it's cranked all the way down. So I'm probably around four to five PSI, maybe less. And you want it, you want it like this. You want it really, really low. Get this set up. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty anal about my models not looking the same. No two, none, no two of my models look the same colorway. I'm pretty, pretty tight about that. 
Um, and that's why the OPR process, in my opinion, is, is really as powerful as it is, because one of the things when you guys really start to adjust and, and get used to how it works and get going with it, um, I can fine tune my, my dust colors on everything with the, you know, on the OPR palette just as easily too. And that's the beauty of it. Like, I'm tuning everything constantly. There's never a, I never do same, same, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, Ivan Jensen Taylor, hello, how are you guys? You guys are saying hello to each other, you must know each other. Uh, looking forward to this, I find that when I use pigments, it literally just looks like someone's put a colored powder on my model. Not at all natural. Using X20, do you find the pigments drop everywhere? Uh, I mean like fall off the model? No, I, I've been doing this stuff for so long, like none of the stuff, if you guys are having problems and be specific in like what you think is going on and I maybe I can help you, Anything I show you, I don't have problems with. In other words, like I'm not doing this and over here it's getting messed up. So if, if they're coming off the model, then you either probably not, you're not, something's not right. So give me either the, 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 the Jimmy Jam, what am I thinking of? The ingredients that you're using, like what brand of pigments, maybe with what thinner. Uh, it could be, could be something, you know, again, I don't use everybody's pigments, so I don't know. I've basically been using 502s for, for 15 years, so. Uh, if you use the other another brand and something that just didn't work, Hugo, maybe that was why. I don't know, but yeah. And this process here, what I'm doing here, this is nothing to do with with the mud pigment stuff. Um, but yeah, let's see. What I'm just going through the questions, making sure <clears throat> the nog been to. Oh, you guys are talking to, to to Mike. Okay, yep. New Zealand is awesome. Someday we'll travel down. Not today though. You got to open that island up first, right? <laughs> It's just a shit show. I did hear that that I think even though, yes, the shipping issues are, are huge, a lot of countries are shut down, especially island countries. Um, we can't even get stuff in regular mail. The, the DHLs and some of the other carriers can get in. That's not the end of the world. Um, but like US Postal can't get in and stuff, but like that. I am hearing though that the countries are gonna give up on this program. That's what I've been hearing from some of my other sources that it's just not working out with them shutting the borders off completely for stuff. So, um, So hopefully we'll see. Uh, let's see. Hey, Drew, what's up, bud? You're not late. We're just getting started. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Yeah, just if you have if you're having problems with with the process, guys, give me give me your specifics too. We'll try to we'll try to wrap it around and, and maybe if we could replicate it, we'll try to do that too. So we can we can solve a lot of stuff on stream. I just need more than just a general failure so we can fix everything. Okay. Alrighty. So we have our base thing. This is a matte paint. Uh, I'm just not even going to argue it. Don't try to say we do satins or glosses. Pigment work is always over a matte surface. Just that's what it is. Don't, I'm not even going to get in that one. Not doing that conversation with anybody. I've never done it any other way. This is you. You put the matte surface down for the tooth. The tooth. Now you need a shitty brush. So these are old Jimmy Jams. <laughs> Don't use your good ones. Don't use your brand new King Art brushes for this process. These are just old. What is this? One? I think one's a. This one says it's a five, and the other one is so worn out. <laughs> Wait, there's almost, I don't know. They say they're both fives, but whatever. doesn't matter. Just the, these are just some of my bigger, bigger uh, shitty ones. Uh, what else we got? Okay, we're ready. Anything else? No, okay, everybody good? Okay, later on, think, no, we're not doing any yet. Oh, you're talking to him, so okay. Uh, what else we got? Ozzy's saying hello, 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 hello. Yeah, they are museum pieces. They're pretty up there. I don't even remember this one. These would have been in-store purchase, Royal Gold. I don't even know who they are. I used to work, when I worked back at Mid, I used to, I did. Uh, back in the day when I worked at Mission Models Hobby Shop, this was be 0405 in Atwater Village, Los Angeles. One of our regular customers came in, I think it was from Mexico, so he'd come up like every other month or so. And he brought just like a bag of like a thousand brushes. <laughs> he goes, here you go. We put them in a little bin and we just, we just that's where probably a lot of these come from. Um, okay, matte surface. Do, 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 do. And I'm just using this rail stock as an example. I'm not trying to be a dusty rail. This is just because it was perfect. <laughs> it's a good color contrast. A little stipple action. I don't even have my eyeballs on. That's how easy this is. But you can see because of the matte surface, how that grips, you can see I just get a beautiful... Like, did you just see, like, we're done. The show's over, <laughs> this is it. No, I'm kidding. It is this easy though. I mean this real, sin in very sincere ways. This is the reason I do this process. When you need a grittier, if this is the, if this is the front uh, glass display of a, of, a, of a Panzer, 
This is the nose of a Sherman. And we'll repeat all this through again. We'll go through the whole thing. Um, this has a real nice matte surface on it from the previous demo streams. Um, and that's it. Layer one. Okay, set this in place. Okay, so the trick is you can probably see, so I'm up here with the airbrush. Airbrush is up here. That distance there, let's see, that little finger to finger, that's, that's a little close, but a little bit further, so just, you guys see, just spitting it, just, and you can see that, let's see, as it needs to in. So the beauty of this, if you saw that, what you're seeing right now is, is, is see the specs when the, the, the droplets are hitting? That's why I do it from a distance, that's why I spit it on there, um, and then that gives it that kind of gritty, dusty texture and it dries almost instantly so you don't have to worry about the hair dryer and I should, I should just so you all know what we're doing here because this is this is where the common the, where the question comes from in um, tank r2 hairspray chapter oil paints and then the pigments it's painting all of drab okay this page So what we're doing here is, is the process as described in Tankard 2 specifically. Uh, and the reason is the particular types of color schemes I was doing in this book, there's a lot more dust work in this particular volume. Uh, and then all of this up in here is, is what I'm talking about. It's exactly what you just saw right there, the one to one. And then the big dog, uh, the fan favorite, It's exactly the same process that I'm doing right here. Try not to bust anything. It's all this. So this is what we're doing today. It's all, so this is the model I developed this technique on. I had gone to uh, your military. The model received the silver medal. Um, not that I was unhappy, but I knew I could do better. I wasn't happy with the model when I put it on the table. You know how like when you do contest models? <laughs> Just pinch <soon. laughs> That's been a minute. So all this right in here. This is what I was going for. I wanted a really gritty, dusty texture. Like, how do I do this? How do I recreate this? And this was the challenge because nobody's, nobody's like, a, and not the, not an ego thing at all, guys, at all. It's just, I had to figure it out. Like, how the F do you do this kind of work? Like, I was trying to figure out what dust pigments and, and oils and, and enamel products and everything. Like, was, I was just trying all sorts of different stuff. And it just hit one day. Um, and that's kind of, it, it's the, the trick to this to get that look it's the airbrush spitting part. And so you can go to like one or two PSI. Um, and that's really, um, no, I know pants are Like I'm never satisfied. Don't get me wrong. Like that's always like that. You know, when we talk, when I talk about putting in work, when you guys ask me questions and if I bark a little bit, like you got to put in the work and the time. I brought a silver medal Euro military tiger one back to me. The dude at TSA put his mitt paws all over the thing during checkout through customs. Re redid the whole thing and spent probably another three to four months developing ideas, working with the oil paints, because that's the year that, that, that I, I got my first round of oil paints, and trying to figure all this shit out. And all the time it takes, you have to put the time in, man. You have to go to the range. So that's that's where this comes from. That's where I really want you guys to, to, to really embrace the fact that it's not gonna happen right away. You gotta come in, and, and, and it's good to see the you guys, some of you, like TJ, when you put that post up, you know, like you just said like the right thing. Like, you know, I bet, what he did was he did a couple layers, maybe one or two layers, and then and then boom, done. And so what I'm going to do now is let's let's go. This is this is round two. Same with the this is all the light tones. And so what I'm doing is kind of building up the opacity a little bit down low. See how this is starting to get a little bit more opaque in here. And you'll get some loose blow off from the airbrush. Same, same process. Okay, I'll hustle now, I'll show you. So that's two. And this is actually, it's actually on the surface pretty good. It, it'll it'll hold up, it won't come off. You can put fingerprints in it, so dude, don't touch it, but um, it will hold up. Here, let's do this too.
So this is layer three, right? A little bit of light, a little bit of medium. Same thing, I'm spitting it from about, um, about 20 centimeters. It's about a foot, maybe 10, 10 inches, 12 inches away. Two to three PSI, just, just little kisses. And you can, you can actually, if you want to, you can walk that in a little bit. See how you get a little bit more wet in there? That'll give you a little bit more uh, kind of a fix into that. See how we're starting to get a little bit of that medium come in for the for the for that other color. We can put a little bit more in that. So this would be what four? Is this number four? Here, I'll even I'll even do a little love there for that too. Just kind of This is just the other classic way with the wet. So what would happen is if I put a drop of this onto that surface, so it's gonna start to do that. When this dries, it's gonna look totally different. So that's why that's why airbrush fixed that down to get that kind of gritty. And you can play with distance and, and, and kind of, um, other factors for that airbrush part of it. I've got kind of the camera and stuff in my way, so I can't get like, I mean, I could probably try a little bit different angle and stuff too. Let me dry that off just so I can just show you. All right, I'm gonna blow, so hold on a sec here. There's a bunch of dry pigments there. Let me come over here and air dry this. And you'll see where I put the spot of, of, of One, you got a nice tide mark. Let's see. So that's what, three layers plus I was just showing you what happens when you do that to it. It's not the end of the world, but you're, you'd probably want to wet that whole surface almost to avoid that, that kind of line. Um, gives a slightly different look to it. But this all up in here is the, is the gritty part that I really, really like. So, let's see here. So the, the, the type of old brush you have kind of, kind of helps. And you can just take a, you can, oops. Uh, you can just take any of these kind of brushes and just, you know, buy it all cheapy, number four, number five, number six, whatever the big fatties are, and just like crush them on the table, really get them messed up. You know, don't, don't worry about the brush at all. And once you get a brush with pigments and stuff on it, like that's just all it's ever going to be. Which is no biggie, you know. So I was able just to, to come right back over that uh, and cover that right back up. So the matte surface is crucial. Um, airbrush kind of spitting that fixer down is crucial. Um, kind of stipple action with this to get kind of that, that patchy, gritty dust look. So those are the three main things that I'm doing here. So you can see as that, as that fixer kind of kisses down, you can see how it kind of leaves those spots. So that's on there, that's not coming off. Um, that kind of gritty texture to it. Okay, so let's, that's kind of demo number one. Um, get this guy out of here. There. Uh, let's switch to this dude here. Okay, we should be able to do the same basic stuff over this guy. Actually, what I should do is, got plenty of these guys. Uh, what else we got? Did I miss any? <laughs> probably, probably not. Paying. We haven't seen these spammers. Any, any, any uh, advertisements coming through today? <laughs> yeah, those. 
Uh, it's X20A. X20 is to me is thinner. A is their acrylic thinner. X20 is their enamel thinner. X22 is different. In fact, I think X is an X22. They're clears. I don't remember that. That way I saved my spanning sponge a little bit. Uh, did I miss anything? <clears throat> did I miss anything? But is that hitting home with the dusting? You guys catching that? Uh, let's see here. It's rolling back up. What do we got? So the thinner can absorb the pigments and comes over in sync. Just tune in. Hello, 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 Ozzy. I don't really have a problem. The pigments just seem to have, have a bit of a stigma around them about being messy. They are messy. You'd have to be really careful with it. <laughs> but that's different than what... It's like it's too common. So Hugo, it's like... You mean, I'm not sure what you mean when they, uh, let me, well, they drop. Oh, oh, so when you say drop everywhere, you mean like this, where they're, what you're saying is this, like right here, like you're getting them everywhere. Okay, I didn't understand that. Okay, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, uh, you have to, you have to, I cover my bench. I've got paper towels everywhere. Um, you don't breathe, don't sneeze. And when you use a hairdryer for certain things, go, go away from the direction of it because you will blow all that powder everywhere. Um, and then when you're kind of done, you can put them in the paper towel and throw them away. That's, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Uh, I, I guess I was confused with that. I hope that's actually a pretty easy answer. <laughs> this was like, what was he talking about? <laughs> um, but anyway, I hope that helped you. There, I, I, my brain clicked up. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that, Hugo. I just misunderstood your first question. Yeah, they are messy. Uh, Ivan says he's been talking to TJ about these facts. He's getting some. Yeah, he is. He's doing good. TJ is TJ's pretty solid for a guy who spends like five minutes a day being a scale modeler. I don't know how he works so fast. <laughs> I'm kidding. But you saw how quickly, actually, to be truthful, you saw how quickly that all kind of goes. <clears throat> Let me do something here real quick. This model's ancient. I'm just going to flush this surface off with some fresh to me X20A just to get any contaminants. Anything off of there? That the rail car is, is only a few months or whatever. It sits in the thingy, so it should be pretty fine. But this thing is years and years old, so I just want to make sure there's nothing on this. But yeah, to the to the tow hook conversation, guys. If I understand this correctly, you guys are, are trying to get the seams off the edge of the tow hooks, correct? Either mounted on the model. I mean, I just I probably put them on the model and just sand them right off on here. That's probably a pretty straight up easy way to do that. Um, and then you can probably knife grind the, the mold line that's in there because that little piece right there, that little catch piece is probably very similar to the Panzer One tow hook. You can do all that with the knife on the model, like if you had to, because that's on the edge of a turret. That should be pretty easy to get to. Uh, that would be my recommendation for that. Do it on the model. Maybe that helps answer that question better. Okay, that gives me kind of a nice fresh surface. Okay, let's rinse and repeat. It's too hard to film the, the low low nose of a T34, so we'll just work on the front front of this nose here. And I think a lot of things I'm seeing too um, with, with colored conversation is make sure your light dust, this colored dust in particular, I think TJ, you got it down. Uh, I'm Nose Al, I like what you see. Some of you guys are a little conservative, a little hesitant. Don't be afraid to, get, to, to go lighter with this color. Um, like I said, I've even got some white in here, so it's it's lighter than it's lighter than the paper towel. Even it's a pretty pretty light color. So a lot of times when I'm seeing dust work, you guys are, are too dark in your tones. So if you want more contrast, which is what a lot of this is going to be about, then go lighter in your dust tones. So this where it's dark green here, he's going to that driver's going to open that. And it's going to be less dust around there. So we're going to kind of push this up, and we're kind of playing fantasy. We're learning. I'm just trying to get a dust layer down on this T34 for you guys. So you can see I'm kind of leaving it clean around here. Again, this is a matte surface. You can see how it's, see how it's gripping on there. See how it's, it's, it stays really nice. And it's, and it's a stipple tappy tap, little love tap. I'm actually going fairly heavy on this first pass. So what, what Hugo was talking about, what I think, I think a lot of you guys fear a little bit too, is there's a lot, it does get real messy, all this loose stuff here. I don't know if I can probably tap that off if I wanted to. Um, well, I actually kind of leave it sometimes because what happens with the, with the airbrush fixer is it'll sometimes grab some of those clumps and it'll give you just a little bit of extra texture through there. Okay, same idea. You see how it kind of blows a loose bit around a little bit. I move it in closer. 
still just kind of spitting it. Little tap tap with the airbrush. Little ch -ch -ch. It's not a consistent spray, so I'm just kind of spitting it. Two or three PSI. See how it starts to kind of. So that's what I, that's why you don't hold it down. You kind of see how I kind of just really lost it right there. It's not the end of the world at all, but I'm trying to keep kind of a real dusty look. So don't go too wet with this. And this is the first layer as well. So you'll lose, this is when you'll lose most of it. This kind of locks it into place. My compressor just kicked on. Okay. And this time we'll do staining, we'll do grease and grime, we'll do other liquid liquid uh, stuff to it. Hey Leo, what's up brother? How do you do Kungol tie marks? Uh, how do I do tie marks? Like when you want to portray culminated created but range. Uh, that's that you can put the liquid if I don't know what when you came into stream Leo But I, I, I showed it real quick on on this guy here, so you can live scrub back uh, a few minutes and see where I put a drop of liquid uh, fixer down and Then let it dry and it'll dry to a tide mark It's gonna be a natural thing you can kind of maybe control it a little bit where you can take a brush and then kind of slightly draw that fixer on I'll give it a shot for you. I'll see if I can pull that off Okay, so we're gonna. So now what I do on the on the on the. So your first pass, I kind of get where I want all my dust. The second, third, fourth, fifth passes, I kind of start to really focus on opacity. Um, this is what I was talking to you about, TJ. Where it's like where you've got those 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 um, whatever those are called <laughs> uh, on the on the on the cover there. Those frame pieces, those bolted frame pieces. You know, come in on each side of those and start packing that that around where that dust is going to capture and stay. There's a lot of loose pigments on there right now, so it's it's gonna move some stuff around. So it's gonna blow some of that loose stuff off a little bit. But my PSI is so low, it doesn't make like a huge mess. It's not going everywhere, everywhere. I'm just trying to keep it off the computer, the keyboard. You can see how you get that little bit of that speckle. And you can use the fixers to clean kind of the edges up a little bit too. Like say you want to knock those down a little bit more. And you could just use the air feature as well just to kind of dry it real fast. So I'm just I'm just pushing down for air and I'm pulling back a little bit for the for the fixer that's in there. So now I'm pulling the model back and trying to now that we're kind of set. So that was two good passes. That my first one was pretty opaque. So I got away with a bit of, of, of there. And then what I'm gonna do is, this is the medium. Kind of a little bit darker around where the where the drive sprocket where the where the where the tracks will kind of go up a little bit, just a slight variation in tone. You'll notice it on the model though. Probably won't see it quite. You see, yeah, you can see that. You see a little bit of that difference. Same idea, same come back, do the same thing. This is super easy, guys. Super chill. The airbrush doing all the hard work for us. And then if I wanted to, uh, let's see here. We'll just use this guy. So for Leo, your question, Leo Tattoo, your question was, so I've got some, some liquid fit that, that put it in the X20A. So what you can do, let's see if this works. I'm un unloading on the paper towel to control how much goes down. I don't want it to flood flood. Yeah, this is this will work. So kind of just gently draw it like where, how you want that kind of shape. It'll bleed out a little bit. You could even do a little bit of a, where's my other little rig here? Speckle with the fixer. So the speckle drops with the fixer will kind of do the same thing, but they're almost translucent. 
I'm giving you all the pro tips today, boys and girls. This is some money shit right here. So say, say the nose of this guy splashed through a puddle and it's a summer, summer day. Summer day, if we feel good. No, no, I'm not singing, sorry. So the speckling with the fixer gets you your first round of, 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 of love right there. Come pull the thing up and, and pull from a higher distance. This is almost dry now, so I'm pulling up from a higher distance on this. And, and you're not going to see these until you, until you really get your eyeballs down on this. But this is like layer one, building time in. You know, it's going to be dusty for a couple days in the field. Get a little more fixer on this guy. Come in here, go on the hatch hinge a little bit. Just for some variety, shits and giggles. So now is this starting to dry? Whoops, zoom, zoom. Okay, it's way dark, it's still wet, so that's why that color looks that dark. It's not that dark, but there is medium on there. Let's advance that. <laughs> So at this point in time, I think we've got, there you go. I wouldn't be unhappy with that, that tide mark right there, kind of an idea. And I could, I could keep going with that and we will, we're gonna keep going with this, but I'm trying to just give you some angles to show you kind of. Now you don't really wanna be touching that with your fingers, but you can see with the paintwork you've got, kind of that gritty embedded dust is already happening. Uh, and I'm going strong so you guys can see what, you know, full blown dust work looks like. Um, it's the same idea back here when I did this older work right here, it's the same concept here. So it just depends on how you wanna play it up. Uh, I'm using like turning this into say say the winter is over and these dudes are running around and it's a you know it's a, it's a month of dry spell and there's there's nothing and it's just everything's drying up now. But you can see that with the with the mediums so you can see how the medium pigments right in here added that little bit of a little bit darker greasier kind of dirtier dust. So you start to play with that up. You got these things over here. I'm trying to show you some of those the spots and stains. You probably won't see them right away. Just taking a peek here. Yeah, they didn't really show up as much, but that's not the end of the world either. Usually they show pretty good. So I'm not sure why that didn't go as well as I hoped. But we've got our oils. Dude, we've got our, we're coming in hard now. Okay, got that, got that. <clears throat> so that's that's applying the dust and armor 101. We'll do it a few more times here, but we're gonna show you uh, applying other chemicals on this. In this case, it'll be oil paints, uh, simply because that's what I have. Uh, Matt's out of here for a bit. Catch you later. Thank you, brother. Thanks for stopping by. Oh, we on a clear coat conversation? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, do you have the pigments in the fire? Yes. Uh, so, yeah, in the process order, pigments are normally towards the end or, or kind of at the very last stages there. Uh, and hopefully that showed you, Leo, what I was talking about. Um, you can just reverse that into a corner the other way, like if you want it in a corner, like a fender joint. If you have a fender joint, Did I put the wrong? Oh, it's this guy. But we'll, we're gonna add some some darker moisture stains as well. Tide mark stains and, and other stuff with, with, with the oils. So the fixer will leave a little bit of, of that love to it right there. But the oils, when we come back in with the oils, we'll build up some color opacity as well. So now I'm getting kind of the multiple kind of moisture collection tide marks in here. So you see how you've got, got a second layer of tide marks in there now. You've got a little bit up in here now from where I just did that, where I just put that stuff. So that's how that's how it attacked that to start with. It's still early in the process. This is early days. I need some tape. 
Let me get this guy stuck down. Uh, what, did I miss a question on clear coats or something like that? Yeah, I probably did. Yeah, you're not going to be clear coating this stuff. Don't even think it, my friends. You will get yelled at. That's a hard no. With pigments, clear coats, in my opinion, are a hard no. There's no, there's just, you know, there's very, very, very specific reasons why you do that. And most of the time you don't need to. Most static modeling, you do not need to. And if you're going to be doing a bit of modeling where you have to handle and grab it and stuff, you're just not going to be putting pigments in those areas in, anyway. So I'd suggest it's just never really going to come up. Because um, even, even the rail guys, like if that was something that they were doing, they're not going to be grabbing it from those spots where I just put that stuff down anyway. And we come, we'll come back to this too. We can pull that, that rail car back in here and do some more. Okay, let me get a little zoomy zoom. Okay, I need this oil here. This thinner, I mean. So what you see me doing here is double side tape this down. This is my OPR palette. And this is the odorless thinner. Come on, get that top part out. Cap on this guy. It's done for now. So this keeps it from kind of move, being tipped over accidentally, which is not uncommon for me. And then it's, this is taped down as well, so that when you use, you put your brush work into that, it's got some resistance, so you can actually get the paint on the brush. So that's what that looks like. Zoom back in. Okay, so we've got this set up here. speckle stick here. First thing I'm going to do, I uh, don't want that, that's the wrong brush, so I'm going to get an oil brush. Okay, I'm going to take kind of a shitty older number two here for this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, on my brush, I'm going to mix up just some kind of a dark gray, dark green, really, really wet. Okay, same idea, speckling. Come in with speckling first because this gives you a nice early layer. One of the reasons I like to do this early with this type of process is you're probably at the point, and I'm sure TJ, this is probably in your head too, is like where you put this, like when you're at this point right here, you're like, now what do I do? <laughs> like, shit, now what do I do? Okay, so let's, the easiest way to go into this is, is start with the speckling first and stuff like this. Get some shitty, greasy splatters on this tank, this vehicle. Uh, this could, this is everything that is moving through the dust will have this effect on it. So. Uh, whether you're seeing big rigs out there or trains or whatever it is, you're going to have this to some degree. Uh, so what I've got here is a really shitty brush. <laughs> Poor guy's got stuff coming out of him. Um, but anyway, I've got like a dark gray color on this. So this is now oil paint. Same idea. So this has got some color in it now. Basically what this is. And you can see how, see how translucent that is. It's not real opaque. unload a little bit of it. Those spots are a little big, but it's not like I don't care. I mean, I don't really care. So get in closer and let's get some small ones going. I took some of the liquid out of the brush by using the paper towel. It's your volume control. Come in here, see how tight I'm getting some of that stuff? It'll start to kick down as it dries. So go where places is gonna be an obvious splatter effect or something where stuff's gonna spill. You know, even on the top of a turret or a hole, you know, the crew is going to drop and spill stuff. They're morning coffee all the time. I spill my coffee daily. You know, imagine being on a tank in the field. I mean, I don't spill, spill, but I dribble. Because <laughs> I'm old. Don't judge. Just going to kind of bump the color up. Down. Just basically in a dark brown, dark green color spectrum. And you can see why just having these two chemical products, these pigments and the oils, uh, no, no, no offense to the now guys. Like I just don't need much else because I could just do so much with this. Okay, so I got a little bit thicker, more opaque colorway on this one now. And you can see the dried stuff here. Let me just show you is when it's starting to let's zoom. Come on, camera, work with me. So you got one spot that kind of dried pretty opaque, but a lot of them mostly disappeared in the pigments a little bit. But you're starting. I'm starting to get some of the some of the layering going with with kind of this with this effect. In fact, you can kind of start to see up in here. On the edge there, 
you're getting little stot spots and stains up in there. I'll look. I'll catch you guys here in two seconds. So chat away. Let me get in here. So this is a little bit more opaque. So now I'm going to get a little bit more opaque again. Still dark green, dark gray colorway. And that's because of the base of this. It's a dark green colorway. I've got some kind of grayish light tan dust. So now I'm taking the oils. I'm kind of painting kind of kind of near this axle hub, kind of a natural kind of spot here. Starting to build up a little bit of a story way with this, where this is kind of, oops, sorry guys. My apologies. So this is me working with, so what I did was I splat, I speckled the effects down first. And then kind of as I was in the, as it get in the zone and the flow a little bit, just kind of the natural area, it started to build up some of the colorway uh, on top of that. So we're working right over the pigments directly. It's a stipple kind of, kind of a little coffee Jimmy Jam shake. I'm just trying to gently touch that thing down a little bit. And you can kind of draw some of this around a little bit. The tip of this is probably a little too, I should probably get a little bit sharper brush now or have another one that's a little bit sharper. So this, this has got kind of that opaqueish kind of green gray color in there. And I'm just using like the weld beads. I'm using the, the broken fender brackets and stuff like around that. Let's get a little bit more speckle around that. Get real close. I'm like half a centimeter away, an eighth of an inch away. I'm just flicking that in there, right in the dust. Let's, we can dry that and we'll, we'll give you a little, we'll give you a little, see what this looks like. And because these all dry dead matte, you're going to get real beautiful effects out of that. Because then what I'll do is here is I'll, uh, you can see how that turned out right there. So you can do that on kind of that, that TJ on that interface of that drive sprocket. You know, you've got that flat plate and then it kind of bolt, it kind of goes over and around that nose of that Sherman or whatever. I think it's, is it a Sherman you're doing M4? Um, you could do this like right up in there. Same, same idea, same concept. And you could do it, I do, I usually do it kind of from below and then up and over, but because this is, this is such a sharp angle, I'm just gonna kind of do it up on top here. But so to Paul Dito, you asked a question on the comments of the stream last time. So what I do when I choose my darker tones, my grease tones, because this is important to almost every effect and I'll, let me just go back up and get you some more questions here. Uh, hey Jason, what's up brother? I'm glad you're here, my friend. You guys are never late. Just happy to have you here. Don't feel bad at all. I just appreciate y'all rolling through because I'm just babbling about spitting oil paints. <laughs> oh, I, I cracked myself up. Okay, so I've got a green model right now um, with a bit of, so just pure colorway conversation. It's it's a 4BO, the, the earth tones, the dust tones on top. The colors I'm using over here, this color up in here. So what I'm doing is, is I've got a dark green, a dark gray, I've got my tans. These are the same relative colors to here. So what I'm doing is my darker tones are coming from the same color spectrum. And, and I've got a little bit of dark brown. There's a little bit of black right here if I need it. Um, and then my dark browns are right here. My dark grays and greens are right here. So these darker tones of this color are what I'm using. If this was Panzer Gray, what you would see was I wouldn't use be using the green. I'd be using my, my navy blue stuff over here uh, with a little bit of the dark gray and going more of a really, really dark bluish gray in terms of the really, really dark greenish gray. So you play up the base color. And then like with, with, the, with the, the Dunkelgelb, the Dunkelgelb, I kind of did a grayish tan color up for the darker tones on that guy last week. Oh, I'm in the wrong, sorry. One of the lenses on the camera doesn't have an auto zoom. That's why I keep doing that. Um, pull that out a little bit, come on, focus. So yeah, these are up, the color up right up there on that edge right there was kind of a darker a grayish brown color to go with the yellow color. So what I do is I use the base color as my tonal range for what I'm doing with the oils. Uh, and that's kind of where you get in uh, where this is all coming from. Zoom back in here. So 
So now let's say we get a little bit of a liquid runoff or some sort of vertical. I'm just kind of farting around a little bit. But because there's a little bit of color in this, do grab some dust tones here a little bit of where's the gray this gray over here get a little bit of olive green over here a little bit of dust over here so now I'm putting a little bit of a dust wash back up in that welds up there so I've got kind of a bleed out of a liquid off that off that front thing Uh, this front weld uh, protected there. So again with the coffee shake here. Drawn right through the dust pigment. And which and how you do this is you have almost no thinner with the oils for this because you see even with a little bit you're getting a little bit of that bleed out. So when that see how that when that dries back down that that kicks back down a little bit. So now you can come back over here, right, right over here, put a little bit of like the dust color back over that dark one to get a little bit more of a layered look. So now I'm starting to really get in the mood here. Like this is this is coming along pretty sweet. And then whatever the details are on the front of the model or whatever it was, or even if there's nothing there, you can see on the left here just how all that little speckling, those three three layers of speckling that we did. We did the fixer speckling. We did a really translucent color speckling, and then I bumped up the opacity and got another level of speckling, and then I actually drew some actual oils directly onto that right there. So if this is an enamel product, like you don't have the oils to say you're using the weathering enamels, uh, what you're going to be doing, the trick to this is, let me move my camera back. So the trick, if you're using the weathering enamels, because it's been a minute for me, but I did use them for years. So you've got it on the brush like this. So you've got your stuff loaded with the brush. Say it's the, oh, I don't forget the name of it, whatever the, the, they have a dust one, whatever the dust is. Come in the paper towel. Uh, if, if, if you don't, come over to your paper towel. If you don't have paper towels on your workbench, you're, you're already in trouble. You're gonna get yelled at. So you don't want that. So get paper towels on the workbench and then wipe that wipe that chemical off of there. Control that down, use, the, use it as a volume control knob because that's a pre-thin chemical. The proportional ratio of the paint to thinner in that is already preset. I'm doing that on the palette, which is where the power comes from. So if it's preset, then come in here, use your paper towel and unload the thinner that's in that and you'll get more pure enamel paint on the brush. And then you can come in and start doing a similar thing. And you're gonna have to get really good at that. It, it does take more practice and, and, and to kind of get that. So that's how you're gonna use that with an enamel type product. It's the same basic application principles, it's just, one has kind of a, a preset a recipe, and then my recipes are just pure ingredients on the palette. I'm, I'm mixing them up as I go. So that's why when, when Zal, when you, you mentioned that comment earlier, what I do, what I'm doing on my model is every time I'm, I'm attacking something is I'm adjusting the tones by the various opacities of the oil paints that I'm using. So if I've got, for example, right now I'm putting kind of a dark pin wash around this hinge right here, kind of leaks into that dust a little bit. On the next model, I'm gonna tweak that color. I'm gonna select a different range of tones, even though it's all the same colors are on my palette, I'm gonna select different proportional ratios of them to create a unique piece each and every time. And that's how I, that's how I actually really attack a lot of this for my own work, my personal work, or the, the, the RSP stuff. So that's why with like a dozen colors or you know you know less than 20 colors you can you can just have a mass portfolio of, of work where they all look the same where you get into trouble where guys get into trouble and i say this critically and i say this like as a judge if i see your work has burnt sienna wash and you know what i'm talking about if he has a burnt sienna wash in every model 
that's when I'm gonna critique you. That's where you're gonna get, you're gonna get yelled at a little bit. So that's why I do that. So I have four or five tones and I work with that and I tweak them up and all that kind of stuff. And then the hair dryer, get that hair dryer in there. So now I've got kind of a, a leaky, greasy hatch up there. That's what I like about Russian armors. You can just go to town on this stuff. You just keep building up that layer. Say you just want that opacity, wasn't it? You just keep going with the color. Just keep building that opacity up. Dark, just go less thinner, more paint. And then what you can do is you can switch your colorway up a little bit, a little bit more of a dark brown with a little bit of a hint of black into it, a little bit of that dark green again. Well, we're a little bit more thinner, a little bit more of a darker color range now. So your fresher stains will be your darker stains, your dark S stains, less bleed. So these are really tiny little specks there. Your older, more translucent stains. So that's how you start weathering in the time factors. Because this isn't all, this does not all happen one day kind of a thing. And these darker, more opaque ones just go a little bit more conservative. And I, and I direct the angle by rotating the, the, the stick here. So I get various. Little speck of stains around that. Now we gotta try that back up, see what it looks like, see where we're at. It's probably a little bit. <clears throat> when I kick down, it's. All right, now I can answer some questions. I think we're at a good spot on this guy. So you can see we're in a relatively fast amount of time. That was probably less than 30 minutes to get that whole front of that hole to this point, at least as far as the dust and weathering is concerned. So you've got some old tide marks in here, some old splash marks. You've got, you know, you've got a week's worth of, of, of just nothing but love on that. You've got some little streaks in there. <clears throat> okay, let me come back up. Uh, missed a few. <laughs> uh, probably have a head down a little too long with that. Girl, I'm waiting for the spam girls to come back. I <clears throat> uh, really love the BMS flat clear. Yeah, I've, I've, again, I've not seen, I'm trying to, I'll probably have to hit Screw Brothers. I'll have to talk to Gordon and see what's up. I don't know about PMS. I haven't really, I haven't really investigated getting them here. Justin Thunder Liger, how old are you? You're old. Who's old? I'm old. You're old. We're all old. I'm an old dude. Uh, Tristan Ridefer, how old are you? What does uh, the must clear coat thing come from? Is it just decal anxiety? Well, that's a good question. It goes back a couple, few decades, Tristan. It's, it's um, most likely the, the cornerstone of that conversation comes from old school decal. And remember too, we should we should put the caveat disclaimer you know all these fuckers that stick a bunch of old mofos like i'm not old i'm just joking around um you know it's this nog in the nog says i'm pretty not young um but we're talking the you know the 65 plus 75 you know they were ipms guys in the 70s and 80s and the decals were, were shitty so let's just clarify that first off old decals are really bad um and it just we're men, so we just become entrenched in this process of, of when you hear about one thing and then 50 other guys say the same thing. It's just that's how this is. In fact, all of this work here, like if, if the enamel conversation didn't exist, then it would be a really straightforward learning experience. But because I'm on the back end of a decade of weathering enamel chemicals and switching over, I have to reteach a lot of you because you come from that generation of how that was taught, which is totally fair. It's just that's kind of what's happening with a lot of this stuff. Um, I've never needed clear coats. I've never seen a need for a clear coat, even when the decaling conversation. The only thing I see, uh, and this is probably a fair example, um, with that conversation is, so what you're doing is you see that little, what you should be really doing with your clear coats or what the purpose is, the primary in this case, because paint's a protection layer anyway. Paint itself will hold up pretty well. Uh, for indoor static models, paint holds up fine. Most people don't get that concept right away. They're like, what? Yeah, no, you're fine. Do you see that ledge? Clear coats fill that, so you get a smooth transition between it. That's usually the primary purpose of it, or what should be the primary purpose for it. 
Um, and then uh, with, with weathering machines of this nature, you're gonna find, and I, and I say this because I've tried it, I keep going back to just to make sure I'm not bullshitting you. You're gonna start with the matte surface. Well, in, in many cases, this kind of effect in particular and stuff like this. Um, guys like, like if you're gonna follow other guys like Adam and, and Martin, they do it a different way. So just be aware of that and they use other chemicals in a different way. So that's kind of where that all comes from. We have our different paths. So if you're gonna look at this and all this kind of stuff, if you're gonna to try to do this kind of stuff that I do on the satins and glosses and all the clear coat stuff, it just is not gonna work. You're just gonna fight it. So hopefully that clears that up a little bit. I mean, I don't care if you use them, but I'm just telling you, just making life harder for yourself. What else we got? I haven't had the problem with the paint, just clears when I'm weathering, doesn't hold up the brushes because of the abuse of oils when I'm, uh, when I'm weathering. I would say truth, another thing too, I'm saying, uh, just to, in case I'm not sure where, what part of the conversation I'm coming into, um, Another thing I see that I think is part of this conversation in the general context, note, and I say this in some of the descriptions lately too, note how little thinner goes on the surface of the model when I'm, when I'm weathering my stuff up. Like that's a critical thing. You note how little bit of thinner was being applied with this. And because there's almost no thinner on the surface, you're not gonna have any chemical issues because of that. And so that's another aspect to how I do things. It's a very controlled and precise application of the chemicals. That's the big difference. You do not see me slopping this shit around and letting it sit. I don't have any problems because of that. So just remember kind of, you'll see it taught one way and I do actually do things fairly differently. It's kind of what I've come to understand from most of the, the things. Cause I used to, remember, I also used to do my things without, you know, I didn't really care what anybody was doing, but now with like live streaming and all this stuff, you know, you guys are, you know, be able to give me feedback and what you're doing. Um, so where are we at now? So let me go back. So John, you're asking a question. Um, is there a way to get similar effects using OPR without the pigments to get dust? Yeah, we're gonna switch from pigments to, um, to oils here pretty soon. I'm gonna do the same thing on the Hetzer real quick though, like I did here, just so you can see it on a different colorway. Uh, normally I love pigments and standard by current models, RC. Okay, cool, I got you. Yeah, yeah, not pigment friendly, for sure. I understand. Um, where did I put them back there for, ooh. My hands are a mess. Yeah, pigments do get a little bit. If you're not, we don't want to be touching everything. So since you've been in every stream, John, uh, this is going to be the, the process, what I did here for the dust. It's all, all the oils. So that'll be, that'll be what we shift to in a little bit here. But we're good on time. We're super good on time. This goes really fast, but I'm going to switch to the headset here in a sec. Let's see. Otherwise, probably don't think you get the texture. Uh, it's probably not a big deal if it's RC then. Uh, but you can do some stippling, some other stuff. You get a little bit of texture out of that. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a solid start right there. Uh, you know, a, a, a good hour on this of just you know maybe a couple good really really good photos of, of you know the front of a T34. You know, say say this was too much. I can come back in like how I did with the oils here. I can actually rebuild some of the colorway. Or say I want to show some some dudes that come in here with their with their boots and they're doing some some scruffy stuff. So this is that color brush, kind of a dry brushed. Can even go drier actually. Dry that immediately. You can see how the pigments fight you. They almost don't even come off almost. So that's how, that's how strong this process is, just in case you're wondering about that. Like these, these dust pigments aren't coming off, but I can cheat this a little bit. A little olive green. I'm just trying to do something here. I'm just trying to fart around real quick. I think I lost my way in the chat. <laughs> I'm so far up on old comments here. Hold on.
So now I'm putting more pure oil. There's a little too much brown in it. Just trying to pull back a little bit of the base color back out a little bit in some spots. Kind of a stipple the raw color right down. Trying to get kind of that scruffy edge to the the hole there a little bit. Probably a few questions going around. Yeah. Get some pretty interesting little things going on. <laughs> We're doing some things now, my friends. So just kind of, this is a dry brush with kind of a pure dark green, kind of a forest green. It's a little probably on the brighter side, but it's a good enough color for what we're doing here. Just trying to get some of that raw paint back up to the surface a little bit. So just kind of scruffily, scruffily, scruffily. What you're seeing is the thinner hit that pigment and turn it dark. It'll, once that dries back down. Yeah. So you can see how we kind of, it actually just knocked down like a little bit of a walkway down there a little bit. So you can just see how we just kind of, don't even need to be precise with that. <laughs> I love it when I fuck around and do stuff and it comes up pretty good. That's always cool. Okay, let me scroll back up. what I miss? Question, uh, do we use the varnish as a wet? You can, okay, so what I actually meant to do, thank you for that reminder, where is my... Okay. So I've got, I wouldn't recommend a full gloss, I'd go semi. Oh, now Mr. Sunshine, Mr. Rain, Mr. Sun. I might have to, to redo the, the blinds over here. So you can see how I dry brush the raw oils back over that to pull some of that, that to kill some of that dust that's on, on the, the natural spots of where, um, it's just another way to do it. So what you can do here, let me get a fresh thingy. So I'm just gonna pour some raw semi. Just a little, that's dust. <laughs> not even gonna say it. <laughs> I'm not gonna say nothing. I should probably, let me knock that down just a little bit. It's a little on the, a little thinner than that. So this is all mission models. It doesn't matter though, you can just whatever. Because you this is for effect, this isn't. Anything else? Okay. So I've got a little semi gloss here. Getting a little bit of sun glare. I'll have to close that in a sec, guys. I'm sorry. Figure that storm will last all day. So as Al was just asking there, I meant to do that actually. Come back in here. So this is a semi-gloss clear.
Okay, so what I'm trying to do is just kind of captured moisture in that dust a little bit. That's all we're trying to show here. More, more moisture than oil or anything like that. This is just more just captured kind of moisture. And the reason I use a semi, a little bit kicked down semi, is just, uh, it, it's a little bit more of a scale effect when you use like a pure gloss for this kind of stuff. Uh, even on engine deck spills and stuff like that, if I'm putting a gloss, I tend to go more of a semi-gloss. And that'll actually stay a little bit on the darker side too. When it dries out, it will really... Yeah, it stays. So. And then what I normally would do is I'd probably go even more translucent. Uh, it's a, it was a little bit opaque in terms of the just the raw, raw thinner out of that. Come on, focus. Stop focusing on my hand. There we go. <laughs> just wants to focus on my hand. So see how it stays a little bit wet. That's a semi. That's a little bit too opaque for me. I'd probably diffuse that out a little bit more. So over here, these see how they're staying like see how that stays like a dark tone like that. That was a little bit of a, my, my brush work wasn't as good. I should have gotten the joint a little bit more, but that's no big deal. Yeah, so that, that the varnish part of that will, will give you a little bit of that sheen. Um, so there you go. Looking pretty good, Mr. Kata. A little bit just on the hinges there, so it looks a little bit more of a, a greasy wet stain up in there. A lot of times the light has to catch that just right too if you've got that effect going on. really old pigment work but same idea semi-gloss on the brush right into the pigments directly and that'll that'll actually dry to a slight sheen and give it kind of a moist look and then what you kind of do is you diffuse that out and that gives you that kind of half dried look a little bit as, as well uh, it's not the best example but that's the application process of it but anyway, this part up here, this will hold up. This, this is you saw how dirt, how hard it was for me to get that off with the brush up here. So I wouldn't put fingerprints in this, but it'll, this isn't going anywhere. This is the, you're good to go. There's no reason for it to do anything else with that. And if you clear coat that, you're screwed. It's just gonna look like shit. And the reason why I say that, okay, now it doesn't even want to show it. So that's got a varnish on the on that top surface after I did that. So it just it just kills all the very it's all one sheen now. So what we, what you're losing there is you're losing all the variations of the patinas between the really dead matte faded paint and then the, the slightly other base paint. It's all got one basic toy like sheen, even the exhaust system now. So you lose the variety that could be up to, to 10, 20 different levels of sheens uh, that you'll see on a model when you start to varnish a, a top weathered model like that. So that's why you don't do that. That's my main reason why I don't do it. Okay. Question and answers, let me get caught up with you guys because I fell way behind. Uh, let's see what we got here. Overpaid loser. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, what did I miss? Uh, Y'all have the answers. Uh, Y'all have the answers. Thanks again. Uh, what did I miss, Max? All right, let me scroll up a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, I got Leo's. Okay, so we got Leo answered. So let me go from him down. Um, Max said more often he's working off a of mat. Yep, always, almost, almost always a mat surface. Like 99% of the time I work off a of mat. I don't even, in fact, the only time I engage in the clear coat conversation is when you guys ask. That's how little I use it. Um, yeah, uh, let's see here. It's pretty weak and very cured paint. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Imagine I'm using the thin and moderated cure surface. Okay, for those of you who knew the streams, okay. Let me. I'm just catching up, guys. Hold on one second. Uh, don't miss anything. Uh, Tomas, hello, buddy. How are you? Uh, clear coats kill everything. Yeah. So that was just like that was what I think I did was on that Hesse was just to show myself, just to just a reminder that when you varnish a, a really nice weathered model with the oil paints and then you go with the with the with this like a clear coat, it just it just killed the whole thing. Um, but yeah, okay, so for me the clear says, you guys are just talking about that, okay, did I miss anything else besides that? Um, we've answered that enough, I think. Um, let's see, amazing effect, so what would you do to do that to add some fresh glossy? Okay, the Ivan, so that's, yeah, so we just did that, so we answered the, that answer for you, Ivan, hopefully. I'm just, I'm, I'm a few questions behind. Uh, let's see, yep, shipping the VMS is really decent. Um, that's good. Okay. 
um, pigments overpower the OPR underneath is a toss up for me to use pigments to replicate dust to OPR. Um, so uh, what I don't do, Sebastian, to your comment there, pig it says pigments overpower the OPR application underneath. Usually when I do pigments of this nature, there's no OP OPR underneath. I usually don't for that reason. They will cover everything. Then start adding in the other stuff with the oil paints effects like the way I just did here for all these other little effects on top. And then come back in and I pulled up the color back on that. And I can even start to OPR even some of the stuff, some of these other areas if I want to continue to show more wear and tear as well. So yeah, I typically don't pre-weather a surface that's going to get pigments. That's just usually what I don't do. There's just it's a waste of time most of the time. So it depends on how light of a dust layer you're trying to do, but even then it's just it's just kind of I'm not going to do stuff twice for the sake of doing it twice. If I'm going to build up my layers, I'm going to be more efficient with that process. So usually that's what happens. Pigments has kind of always been the last element to stuff and or they're, they're usually, all, for, for machines that run in dirt, they're almost always the lower edges, lower part of, the, of a vehicle first uh, in terms of pigments. And then as they go higher up the vehicle, they switch almost entirely to oils. Um, that's usually what I do. So James Lynn, I prepared a palette to do some movie art two days ago, but while life got me too busy, uh, it's all started. How did you store it, James? You're not too late, my friend. Um, did I answer you, Ivan? Okay, cool. great. Okay, cool. Yeah, that cleared the topic. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I know, I know it comes up. It's contentious because, you know, if there's, you know, 50% of the hobby does a clear coat conversation and, and I'm in that 1% that just literally doesn't give a shit. So I don't use clear coats that much. It's just not something I think about. You guys, are the only the only reason I talk about it is because you guys ask. That's how little I use it. Oh, let's see, I hope you can make a compressed video on this on Patreon. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, there's tons of that coming. Uh, I haven't done a Patreon video this week just because I've been super, super busy with the with the printer and stuff. Uh, let's see. Okay, no, okay, no, that's not, yeah, I usually don't. Uh, and then that's that's yeah, that's kind of just the, the nature of it. Pigments tend to everything on top of pigments. Um, uh, whatever. So what else we got? Yeah, okay, cool. You got a fall? Okay, great. Uh, I was about to get a stripper, or stripper, <laughs> stripper. You got it. Wait, what? <laughs> you about to strip paint? Yeah. It's been a long time since I've been to throwing a model in the stripper bath. That's for sure. Uh, catch you later, Neil. Thank you for swinging by. Appreciate that. Okay, we're gonna switch models here in two seconds. Uh, we'll stuff up. Yeah, use that, Darren. Use that Panzer Ford as a test piece now, buddy. Old Tamiya Panzer. Yeah, any of the old Tamiya kits are great test pieces. Um, there probably is. There usually, usually the the Spanish companies put gloss varnishes in their stuff if they're looking for a sheen uh, of, of of a shininess to them. That's the easy. Like I use a semi gloss, so they probably put something else in there. Uh, but a lot of times they're using enamel products, so it's an enamel gloss, so a little bit different. So this was an acrylic, but it's not the end of the way. It's no big deal. Kind of, kind of all works the same. Uh, what else should we? Dave Brown tutorial making diorama. Yeah, Dave Brown. I'm gonna talk to Dave in a minute. My boy. Yeah, he's a very accomplished diorama model. Uh, what did Mike ask? If it was answered, had to step out on the tiger. Did you do OPR fuss? Oh, okay. That's what. Oh, that's what it all came from. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, not really, Mike. No. No, no. The, when I when I went through the dust pigment process and then um, on the front of that tiger and stuff, the, what you saw in the T thirty four is like the majority of how I do this. Like what you saw here. So that's like watch that part of the video. That's the the premise of it all. There's really very little work done underneath. If it was, it was just because it was a previous level of work. Like I said before, in that particular model, I stopped, took the show, came back and did more work on it. So in that case, there probably was something on it, but. Uh, when I did this type of stuff to it, uh, no, I didn't. So what else have we got? Uh, let's see. There's Control Z. <laughs> it's terrifying. Yeah, I, and I do. I think I think probably the biggest hangup of the male ego is particularly that you're gonna fuck this up. Um, I'd say that's probably nine of ten of the things. If 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 like you're fighting color conversation, if you're fighting um, product application conversations, you know, it's your familiarity with it. You know, I, and, and I try to, that's why I try to relate the sports conversation as much as possible. Um, golf is a fantastic relation to this because of the complications and variables involved. And you're gonna suck at golf if you never do it and then try to play 18 holes. Like you have to go to the range and hit the bucket of balls on a regular basis. So you're gonna get good at this kind of stuff because you're like, I'm doing this on, I'm, this is, I've, I'm at the 20,000 hour mark now. Like it's, this is intuitive to me almost and that's, that's cool. But when you're starting out, so what I'm trying to do is break it back down to give you those those steps and then you just repeat those steps and you build up that confidence and that's how this comes um, you know 10 and I say this to a lot of guys before is that it like for some of you you're doing this for the first time we'll do it when you get to the 20th time you'll see the 10th time it takes a minute 
So just understand, Adam and Martin, everybody else, it's all this all took us forever to get here. So just have to understand it's gonna take you guys a bit. Like look how many uh, models TJ does, for example. I mean, he's, you know, in the t short time I've known him, I've seen probably 20 or 30 different projects roll through. So it's, you gotta speed up and stuff and, and get some just base crap models down to just play the nose of this up and slap it down and then do your thing. So, cause you're so worried about messing up your, 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 your fancy model. Trust me, it don't matter. Just gotta, just gotta do it. And it's the same thing in your in your day jobs too. Everyone you know that you've gotta you've gotta do the practice and the stuff too. But yeah, so that's a big deal. Um, so James said he's starting to stay with pallet case thing. You just take it further, leave it in the fridge. Read. So when I, James, when I, so why sort of in just for reference for you, would, when this cardboard dude, so I set this up at 10 a.m. this morning. It's 4:55, 4:45. So this will go into here. Now, without the fridge conversation, if I put it in here, I this was today, Wednesday, I should be able to use this up till Saturday. Um, so it probably wasn't, maybe just didn't seal it tight enough or something. That's all I can think of. Um, best I got for you. Uh, but the cold temperature, low humidity of the fridge would make sense for it to, to, to stay operable longer. I, like I've said before, three, four days is about the tops I usually get out of my pallets, usually. But I'm turning them over pretty quickly anyway. Um, and even as fast as I turn them over, I've still got all my original oil. So don't worry about using a paint or anything like that. You're not going <laughs> to, that ain't going to happen. Okay. Did we get through all that? Okay. I hope so. Okay. Let's, we're going to just do a quick repeat. Uh, I won't go as slow. Oh, let me, let me shut that blind down. It looks like, looks like we're going to lose. All right. Let me put one more layer of cover up on the window. Because Mr. Sunshine is poking his head out today. So what we'll do is we'll do the Hetzer with the yellow scheme, the light scheme, so you can see that. Um, to those of you that were questioning or talking about oils uh, instead of this, just remember this stream here, or on all the streams that we've been doing this guy on, this is all oil dust work in here. So just you know, just remember there's there's also plenty of of, of reference for that too as well. I'm just calling this stream dust stream because because it came up as dust, <laughs> but all the work I've been doing. All this stuff here the, the, with the oils, all the dust work on that, all those light tones in there, that's all OPR, it's all oils. Same thing, all this stuff. Same idea, same concept, all this stuff in here. So that's all the uh, same idea. Putting the light tone embedded in the paint. So this one's a little tougher because it's so in the, this, the light makes it look brighter than it is the angle. And this is a light, this is actually a lighter face of this color here. So it does get a little bit. All right, so we're switched to oils. Grab some brushes. Some brushes, we need some brushes, man. Some more fresh brushes. Let's go see here. I got some brushes and then I need, don't need the bigger ones, I need a little stipple jam. Okay. Uh, no, wait, I wanted to do pigments on, I'm sorry, I wanted to show pigments on this colorway is what I wanted to do, my bad. I confused myself. Back to the original operation. So these pigments will probably be a bit darker for this colorway. You'll see and see what happens here. So I'll use the light first. Same, same deal, this guy here, this guy here. So that's how I load it up a little bit like that. Now this is where the low contrast conversation comes in.
see that color is really, really similar. So let me actually let me just switch thinners in this guy too. So what I get, my friends, I've got Tamiya acrylic and a Mission Models airbrush. That's not good smart. Few drops of that thinner switch swapping that out we're on a we're on a mission models acrylic so we're just switching brands of thinner i'm just kicking my okay. everything's in my way oh f-15s it's oregon air guard if you hear those jets that's what that is So what's happening is the fixer, what you're seeing there is the fixer goes in dark or goes in wet and then darkens that, that, that pigment up. Turn on. So see how it's, see how that thinner is in that corner there? That's why when it, when it started to hit, it looked really dark all of a sudden. You're like, it kind of was like an oh shit moment. It's not, you don't have to worry about it. So this is where it's kind of a low contrast setting. Um, it's it's slight, it's definitely a different effect because what you're missing there is, is, is what you're missing between the two is this is a high contrast colorway where you've got the, the dust on the green. And so you see a lot of that, but whereas you get a lot of the very similar tones in that corner to the base color of the model. So you're gonna get a little bit different look with this, with this, yeah. Oh, James, thank you, brother. Oh, I forgot, yeah, Super Chat's on. <laughs> ah, forget, yeah, forget all that stuff. Okay, so thank you, thank you again, James. Okay, so let's see here, what was I doing? Come back over here. Again, this is a really low contrast setting. And this is just showing you application. I probably, I don't know if I necessarily would do this, you know, intentionally. You could go with a darker colorway. You know, you can come in here and definitely go darker. It's the problem I have with this when you go dark on a light colorway. I personally don't like the look very much just from just aesthetics, from a personal aesthetics look. but we'll probably have to punch this up just, just so you can see a little bit better. Again, let the, use the stippling. You can see how it looks, it looks fairly radically different than when you saw it on the other colorway. And that's just because the colors are showing differently through the different translucencies of the, of the paint itself. Like that, that dunkle gelb shows you things differently than the green does, even though the process is identical. So that might confuse you in that sense, but it doesn't actually. It does it all the same. So then, and then what I'm doing is I'm tapping around the edge of this cloud here to kind of kind of soften that transition and then leaving the edges kind of cleaner. So same thing, grab the airbrush. Start pretty high. Spit it down. You can see all those little speckles coming in. It looks crappy when it hits wet like that because that's just the color. That's that's the wet fixer turns instantly dark. But at least you can see what I'm talking about. That's how you get that grittiness to it, that spottiness to the dust. Just, I'm just spitting that on there. That should really, should really show you. Probably like one PSI. So not the airbrush. <laughs> That's why when you go darker on the light tone to get contrast, it just doesn't look as good. Like that actually looked like I wouldn't do this. <laughs> so just, just 
for a disclaimer, I wouldn't do this because I just think that looks terrible. But that's the same identical process over there. Now we could we could go through here and let's let's see if I could work some magic and maybe save this or not. <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, I wouldn't have done that. I was hesitant to say and do that, but I know it's in the, it's in the head of, of you guys. Can you go darker with the pigments? And well, this is what happens. But, but my friends. Okay. So I come back to the oils. I switched the oil brushes again. The pigment work is pretty much done for this. So we can come back. Well, we probably could do more layers. We could probably go light layer. Let's see what happens. Let me go back to the light pigments here. Let's jam some of that in there pretty good. Build up that opacity. So we can get kind of. It's raining. Okay. okay, so let's swap this around a little bit. Okay, now to the oils. It's still a little half wet, that's fine. Okay, so this is gonna go a little bit of like a, a little bit dark gray with a little bit of the tan in it. And then a little bit of the brown. So whereas I was using the dark green before, I'm using kind of a darker brown because it's a yellow base color. So we're gonna just like before, kind of get this, kind of get the speckle set up here. Come back in, load it up a little bit more. Trying to get the brush just about right. So now I'm going to throw down some light oil speckles right into the dust. And I'm confident enough I'll go, I can go right into the capture some moisture right up in here. Taking the same kind of a little bit of a medium brown, a little bit of the tan. It's a slightly darker shade to the base color. as dramatic as I was with the T34, but. Some speckling in there. And what I try to do with this is where I get kind of a shape in here is I'll come back with the speckles and I'll come back around and I can then kind of, the speckles kind of give you like a visual blend between the two areas a little bit. Is the resolution off? You guys got to switch on your end. You got to select 10 1080p. I've noticed that with my YouTube, it changed again where I have to reselect uh, the 1080p, and the, it's the little gear button. And click that. That should open up. And it, if you're not on 1080p, that's probably why it's not looking as sharp. Hopefully that helps. Need a sharper brush here. So I'm just right now. I'm just trying to it's kind of the same thing I was doing with the T34. A little bit less um, hectic. And it just seems to be the way I treat my German armor a little bit less hectic than I do my Russian armor. Oh, my hand slipped. 
Now that there's nothing I can do about. Other than so now I've got to play that whole stain up there because my hand slipped and jammed the brush in the surface. Let's see what it does when it dries. I might have saved it. Yeah, it's fine. So again, I'm just showing you technique with this one right here. I wouldn't do this to a head too normally. I just don't think that's a good look. Well, let's see here. What else have we got? Hold on. So now I'm just doing some more like darkest tone speckling in here. Just trying to add some life to this because when you do when you get some like this big broad open area with this with this much dust on it, um, it's there's you have to kind of bring some interest up into it. And you don't really want to come in here and start pin washing stuff too much. But I'm gonna to try to bring in a little bit kind of a stain up in here, captured stain up under this. because the camera's focused on my knuckle. And it's too wet. Let me get that thinner out of there. That's too much. Hold on a sec. Let me reset this. There's that lower level transparency one in there, so I'm trying to. I don't really want to get super streaky. Streaks are well overplayed, by the way, but I don't think I have a lot of choice right now. I'm going to lock myself into that. Hopefully, that cuts down when I dry this. That's way too strong on a streak, guys. Don't be doing that. Don't do it like that. Going dark with the dust color was, was a bad play. It, now I'm fighting all sorts of issues with that. And there's probably, a, truth is, if I had done that on a real model, there's not a lot I could do with this one. We might chalk this up to an F up, boys, to be truthful. We might have to scrap this paint job. Because there's not a lot I'm going to be able to, to do with that at this point in time. Even though I come in here and try to. I'm gonna have to maybe get like even more intense around it. That'll kind of visually kill it. You know, you're gonna come in here. And... Am I missing anything in the chat? <clears throat> the dirt show. Yeah, what I should have done was just keep the dust down isolated, probably below this line here where the where the where the front of that goes. That's probably what I should have done because this has side skirts and then it's got a front fender on it. Whereas that one, the, the tracks overhang the edge of the tank a little bit, and there's no front front fender on that one. So well, let's see here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to actually build up more around it and that'll kind of visually balance kind of this bullshit right here 
you know, these, these little hooks in here, these little dudes here. And it's kind of like just a really translucent kind of a kind of a deal. And like I said, it's it's too much. Don't think this is this is probably the worst I've done on stream in terms of an effect. Because I would criticize you guys if you were doing it like this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to build up more visual other elements around this. And this will help kind of pull this back down a little bit. But you can see how kind of just working with the dust and the pigments, what kind of stuff you can do though. I'm getting some decent effects within the specific areas though. You can see why I like that a lot better for this kind of colorway. So that's an argument that you could probably back off the pigments in this in this level of stuff when you're doing it on, on too much tone on tone. You might as well run with it now. But still still you can still save this a little bit. at this point in time. Yeah, this is this is not a look I'm a fan of, <laughs> to be truthful. Oh well. I was defeated there, boys. I lost. <laughs> We're gonna put this guy aside. I'm just that's at that point in time I'm 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 forcing myself. And there's no point in that. Alright, what do we got? Did I miss any other questions? Jumping in, jumping in to quick say hello Forrest. Uh, down and dirty pigment show. It is that. Uh, maybe those are the tears of the dark. <laughs> yeah. It's just way too strong, way too stark. Yeah, I just went to this. It was wrong choices all the way top to bottom. I guess it's cool to see a mistake, you know, see, you know, not good work. I wouldn't, I would not recommend doing things like this. That's way too much, way too heavy handed. Um, what I was really trying to do is really try to get some, some pigment opacity up on the light tone. And I knew I was fighting with the color choice. So I should have just stuck with the light colorway and just done a little, like got, gone super mellow dust, like just a little tiny bit. And that would have been the better play with that instead of trying to demonstrate a full-blown T34 style front end dusting. So, um, yeah. Uh, what else do we got here? Let's, let's, we can work on this guy, do some tire work and then uh, see what we got from there. What else? Uh, Mike, could you use a wet rake to pull some of the pigments down? Yeah, I could actually, you can do that. You guys all know the answer to these questions anyway. You just want to see me do it. <laughs> turn into a range tricky thing it looks like well the light yeah that makes it. 
It's funny how the camera is capturing a little bit different than what I'm seeing it though. There it goes. I was going to say, it's not as bad. It doesn't look as bad as that. It's a weird little angle of the light. Kind of. It is a very gritty textural dust though. It definitely is is for the, the effect that it got. That's uh, It's just the bleed off of that that driver's periscope there that, that uh, just ruined the effect. Boy, I'd be pissed if I did all that work and I did that. <laughs> uh, again, probably the, the comment on that would then be, uh, particularly on whichever vehicle subject matter, um, what happened here was I put I pulled that dust up too high up here and then try to do uh, an effect around here and then I chose too dark of a color. So what I would have done is probably from that line down do pigments and then from everything up here, you know, go back to the oils and kind of a thing. Just to maintain more of a, of a structural balance of the weathering on this type of a vehicle. It's a little bit different than what the, the T34 had. So this over here is way more successful and this was all done in the previous stream. So at least there's a, a balancing act there. And that's all with the oils there. But you can see, so what I, that's what I'm saying is, is stick with that lighter color in there because that gives you that little bit of the, the, of the ability to work with the tone. Um, this kind of a colorway with the dust effect, and I know Panzer, uh, the, I'm sorry, DAC Panzer's Desert Africa Core, uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge. And almost what happens in it, to avoid kind of a dust wash effect, because that's a very rare occurrence in the desert, uh, is you almost just don't do any dust. It's just that, um, you're doing it almost in the paintwork where the where the the fading of the paint is kind of that it gives you that kind of dusty interpretation, and we should do some like pure desert work as pretty soon as well too. I, that, we're going to be doing that on the Cromwell here, um, quite shortly actually. I'm getting to the point where we need to we need to do that. Uh, what else we got? Uh, what do we get? Um, yeah, that uh, what's happening there, Mike, is that those pigments are down, dude. They're not going to be moving too much. I uh, don't know about you guys, but my woman gives me a show dirtier than <laughs> makes models for free. Plus, less models than making lunch. <laughs> okay. Uh, what else? Did I miss anything else? Uh, thank you guys for the super chat, Dominic and Joe and Zal. Awesome. You guys are the best. I didn't even see these. It, it does it. It should be popping a thing in my head. I don't know why it does that. It usually should be giving me. I gotta, maybe I don't have my sounds on. I uh, really like the dust work. It's mind-boggling that you're laying oils without them blending into one. I'm excited to try to your next aircraft build. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, you're going to see some things, though. you got to be careful with that. Because with aircraft in particular, um, it's real easy to get a, you know, it's a little bit like the the, the, the classic pre-shading look where you get kind of a quilted panel line look, really, with aircraft. So you do. there's some great stuff to do with fading of the paint in, in the markings. You can do some really intricate stuff like that, but just, you know, in terms of you almost got to stay away from the panel lines themselves a little bit because it's real easy to go too far with the aircraft in terms of adding the, the panel lines and stuff like that. So it's a little bit kit specific and subject specific, but, and we will move into that soon. We do have a two aircraft plan coming in. Um, just trying to, let's see, trying to find a, that tire you start with it. This, um, yeah, so this tire here, every single time, <laughs> what is the damn truck? It's the Kraz, sorry, it's the Kraz 255? Is that right? It's Kraz, Russian Kraz. And this is the Trumpeter uh, plastic wheel with their rubber vinyl tile. And there's a little bit, it was sitting in the white snow for a minute. So on this one, it's all in the stream. It says tires and tracks or wheels and whatever it says. I forget stream 15 or 13, whatever I did this all on. Uh, these are gray primer, for uh, a tan primer first. And then I dry brushed on all the dark tones, and I'm not going to do that here today. We're not we're not showing that. I'm going to show you just. I'm going to punch up the dust effects on this guy. Is what I'm going to do. Like next level. Like say say you did this yesterday, and you come back in, you want to punch that up. So that's what we're going to do. Let me see if my little alligator clip will hold there. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Nice. Sweet. I can get these two out of here for a sec. Okay, everybody else good? Was there any other questions? Did I miss any other questions? And if I miss a question, don't be afraid to ask again. Yeah, there's a lot of Bob Ross going on. Uh, that was poop. Don't do what I did there, kids. <laughs> the T34 came out really well, but the, the hats are dust. Even though the technique is fine, uh, I don't like the look of what it... I just don't like the look of that. Uh, what else we got? Uh, that was weird. Just you turned the hair dryer and we had an earthquake. Oh, okay. 
Uh, what else? Uh, thank you guys for the super chats. That's nice. I, for, I keep forgetting to mention that it's even on, and YouTube kind of took like three weeks to turn that on. I don't know what, what happened there. Um, what else? I'm just trying to troll up and see if I miss anything, like question wise. Uh, all good, bro. We're not losing either. You fix it. <laughs> Scrub it off. Sir. Yeah, you can't get that off, John Fossey. You're not going to get that off. You're going to have to strip that paint down. Unfortunately, that, that type of process where you spritz, spritz that fixer on, that dust doesn't come off. You can you could probably try to scrub it down and, and maybe get most of it out. You might salvage some of that. The it, okay, so let's let's have a conversation because it's fair. It's totally fair. Fixing stuff is pro level stuff. That's what separates the you know the pups from the big dogs. So if this happened for real, um, I don't have the equipment here to do this on stream, but you can come in here if you, if you use paint thinner to get this off. You're gonna you're gonna strip the paint. So that don't do that. But you might be able to come in here with water, even a toothbrush, um, and, and gingerly scrub that off so the texture of this comes out. Then what you could do, what I would suggest, my suggestion at this point in time is, grab your sanding sponges, and you might be able to come in here. Because what you're gonna do now, I gotta put my money where my mouth is, right boys? Okay, so say this is an F up. And I'd probably cut some of this up and get a smaller piece going too. Okay, that's actually that is actually working. Okay, so so remedy remedy number one is gonna be um, get what you can off the surface first. And this is I don't this these are trimmed up pieces. This is probably in the six hundred or eight hundred range. It's a man's job right here because nobody takes a sandy sponge to a painted model. <laughs> that, that, that's some cojones. I'll admit that. That took a little bit right there. Oops. Oh, you can fix that light, no problem. So I know um, I mentioned, uh, so yeah, to, I think Zal, you asked me this. So when we repair this, I'll drill these out. I'll drill these out and I've got styrene rod and I'll drill out the suspension arms. And I'll just cut new, cut news, and, and put them in there, and it'll be fine. Same with that. I I drill that out, drill that out anyway, and then you can put your no tech light back in with a little piece of uh, brass rod. That happens all the time. So it is a little bit of abusive setup here. Kind of glad you said that, because I usually don't do this. Oh, there we go. So we're cutting through the paint. So my point was to get this down here, sand this all back down. Get all that off it. So in, in lieu of stripping paint, which I hate, absolutely hate stripping paint. Okay, so we got most of that off of there. Ooh, baby butt smooth too, nice. It's a smooth matte surface, there's a little bit of Jimmy Jim. What I would do now, and we're not gonna do it, but what I would suggest is get it to this point if you didn't like what I did in, in terms of like, I didn't like that look, look like crap. This worked, pull your paint back out, and just put a fresh dusting on top of that and then start everything over fresh and don't repeat the same mistake before. So there's a half save. I would actually probably, and I was doing that real fast just on stream to get it through. I would probably cut some of these up a little bit and, and really precisely, nicely sand that off um, because your paint has some thickness to it. It will it will hold up. Um, and that's why I said before, paint's a protective layer anyway. It will hold up a little bit. And then uh, I would just dust down that fresh coat of paint again and just boom, done, move on. Um, and you pro I probably could save that, literally, literally legitimately save that. So that's, there you go. Pro tip. I still got it. I'm here. I didn't get my butt kicked. Um, uh, on this spot. Uh, which, which spot are you talking about, Detlev? Which spot? On the Hetzer? I was just showing a technique. I was just trying to show a technique. Stanley George, how are you, bud? Uh, two deck. To, yep, I got to do a lot of, yeah, Desert Africa Core. Uh, how do we keep center when drilling? Uh, you're going to want to pop a, a, a deal. <laughs> you want to center punch that, my friend. So either take a small drill, um, whatever. Well, whatever. just put a little point on the center. And if you have to take your time, take a little pencil, draw some lines, cross hatch it, get the center point, put it in there, get a small drill, pre drill it. Boom, done, get another one. You're only hand drilling like like a, you know, two, three mils, it's no big deal. It's not gonna be that crooked. Because what'll happen is once you glue all that back up, you're gonna you're gonna reset that tank so that when it all dries, all those wheels touch level and you're gonna you're gonna make sure. That's what you're gonna do. Take some time. 
Yeah, you're not going to draw like drill out. Trust me, you don't drill that crooked for that small. Uh, pin vise if you don't have one. These are my two main ones. To me, a pin vise holds a small drill bit. And then I've got my kind of, this is a really old one. It's got two ends. I think one's a little bit, holds a bigger bit than that. You're not gonna, you're not gonna power drill that, is out. You're gonna hand drill that with it. That's basic repair 101. That's pretty simple to do. Drill out the old one, put in a new rod. And I've got stash, you should all have styrene rod stashes and stuff. Um, yeah, pretty easy. No, it's no big deal. Oh, is there a new rod? <laughs> tell her, tell her she's welcome. Keeping the husband around. So, Deadlift, what were you talking about, brother, uh, on the Hetzer? Yeah, I would. What I would have done is, is you know, I, again, I was just trying to show uh, it was a fail. What I was trying to show was dust on a light color. Um, this is the work I did from the previous stream. Now that I know that that's who we're talking to, like you, you can go back and watch because I know you're around when we watched when we did this one. So this is the oil work is superior in this conversation to the colorway. Uh, but all this up in here, this isn't bad. This is totally fine. It was just pulling it all up in here, then doing that. There. but we got rid of that no problem just paint there's a little damage right there that would sand a little too you can see how you're getting kind of a nice nice fade there through that yeah a little little airbrush to that little fresh paint little airbrush dust right back on boom done easy peasy okay okie dokie are we back are we all caught up did i catch up on everything um Oh, I don't know. I was I was trying to um, I was trying to just get like a little bit of like a moisture stain in there, and I, I chose, the color was too dark and opaque. Uh, if you watch that brush work back when I was doing that, it just wasn't it, the brush was fighting me on that. So yeah, it was just a bad decision. That was a bad choice, my friend. I did it wrong. Don't do that. Sometimes I got to show you what not to do, I suppose. Okay, so I'm getting a little dust color on the brush. I'm going to put some fresh thinner down on this tire because it's been a minute since this thing has had any love at all. I don't really have anything to hold this properly with. This thing. Okay, a little dust color on this guy here. It's a wet application, nice diffuse look there right out of the gate. A little redemption. I need a little redemption after that last one. So I get that little bit of diffuse. I got that wet thinner down first and then put in the light thin layer of oil down on top, oil color on top. And see how it just diffuses out like that real nice in between. This is the, the red one's the blender, clean. There's no oil on that. So again, if before I, I think I got sidetracked, what I was trying to say earlier with this was to add, so what I'm doing right now is pretend I did all this work like yesterday and now I'm coming in and I'm gonna, I'm gonna punch up the dust levels uh, in between the treads and stuff today. So here's kind of a dry application now. So we've got kind of the first layer of dust down There's a lot less thinner on this. There's more pure paint. And then take a little bit of the blender, just kind of do a little coffee shake in there, give a little bit of a grittiness. It doesn't have to be a super smooth blend at all because it's a tire. You know, just trying to get a little bit of a... So what I'm doing is, is what I'm also at the same time, um, I know a lot of us like the look of kind of the, the, the treads where they're, they're kind of rubbed black like that from usually on driving on the roads. Oftentimes you're, you're gonna see tires where this 
raised surface is no nowhere near as, as black as it is but for artistic sake and model model building sake we tend to do this a lot because it does look cool like i get it um, but you'll see when you actually look at tires in the real world that the contact surface oftentimes is kind of a, a middle range dusty flat grayish color and especially if you're showing it off road like you're not going to have clean treads off road too much it's very rare that that it depends on the, the, the season a little bit but you tend to not have that but we're doing it just for effect for shits and giggles and to show you how to like apply the oils so i got that first thin layer of dust down quickly i hair dried it i come back in with more pure paint same colorway light gray light tannish colorway and i just kind of build it up in between this is like a non-pigment process so like John and you guys that, that are talking about, you know, dust on your, on your thing, this is kind of going back into the oil conversation now. Like if you didn't want to use, like you can definitely use pigments for this too, but if you did not want to use pigments, you can, this is another way. And you can even do the same process, same application process with the, with the enamels, same idea. I use kind of a thin wet layer first and then I come back in, I dry that up real good, gives me kind of a base and then I come back in with more color, pure color. And all I'm doing is grabbing a little bit of the tan with a little bit of a really light gray. I'm trying to get the other side over here. Just kind of gentle stipple around the, the treads a little bit. So actually, this is actually super easy, super fun. This is hard. This is way harder to mess up than what I did with the Hetzer there. But that's no big deal too, because it's you know we're all human, so we're all gonna make mistakes on occasion. Ain't no big thing, chicken wing. So again, the red one switching to the blender there a little bit, just kind of. Just a little stippling here, let it blend that through. So all this process here is super easy to do. This is this is a lot of fun, it's very enjoyable. Even if you have a lot of tires to do, it's actually, um, the look is so cool, it's easy to pull off. And so what I do here is I've got a lot of the really light dust colors and now I'm just kind of slightly building up opacity. And it's worth taking a little extra time for this too, to be truthful if you're, if you're going for contest level work and stuff like that. You see these three or four, you'll see these three or four little layers of dust and stuff that are in here. Like it does show up in person when you, when you're looking at it. So it's worth taking some extra time and stuff for those pieces that you want to shine. And you can see how I, I don't make them all the same. I vary it up a little bit and I do the variations come from transparency and opacity. You know, and to get a more opaque, you just go less thin or more pure paint. Again, I kind of applied in, in the corners first. Put it down in there. Get that in there pretty good like that. Get a few of them done. And then switch to the blender. Little stipple, stipple, little Jimmy Jam in there. Do, do, do. Just in that little bit of a, just a little jiggle just kind of softens that, that oil application there to give you kind of that. And it is paint. So there, the beauty of the, now this is, is, it is a rubber tire, so it will flex and crack, but you have to be careful. But um, for a static model, once this is on, this is paint, it'll, it'll dry up in there too, so. A little spot that does not want to take the paint though. Well, that's good, Zal, because I, I I do hope I can push you guys out of some comfort zones a little bit, or into into a new comfort zone if you will. You know that kind of old thing. Um, 
Uh, Detlef said, I also watched the previous stream, so you do will do the pigments on the front thigh, uh, front half high, or the rest. Uh, probably, um, are you referring to the Hetzer, De Detlef? Uh, the, it would be oils, yeah. I, I wouldn't do the pigments up high above the, the upper. So on this model here, probably what I did was I was I was probably just being, not thinking it through. I just wanted to show you something. Um, pigments below this, let me zoom out, <laughs> a little too close. So probably for this model, the heads are in particular, specifically. And whether you put the, the side fenders on or not, the side skirts on or not, pigments below this line here and then oils above and this is actually really this is actually a really easy model to work with pigments down low from that line below from that crease all the way around pigments down low and then all oils from that above there like all this what you saw from the previous years all the oil work here um, that actually when I remember when I was doing that because I was showing the classic pin wash here and then the OPR work over here that that all went pretty well and same with this back here it all, actually all went really really well so that's what I would do. I'd oil paint OPR the whole top half, but that line is pretty much a split. Because those those also, another reason for that too, is the way the Hetzer was used is relevant to the type of weathering it's going to receive because it was mostly late war urban combat defense mode. T-34s were aggressive. They were pushing through open fields. They're much faster. Um, so they just have a much different type of weathering pattern as a result versus the, the, the Panzer 38 chassis stuff. Um, the Panzer 38Ts in the early part of the war were used much more like T-34, so the weathering does play up a little bit to that. So you do have to start putting those elements into things. You know, I'm thinking Hetzer Urban Combat. I'm thinking Hetzer, you know, late 44, early 45, defensive position, urban settings, villages, stuff of that nature. It's hiding. That was its purpose. That's why the camouflage it used looked like it did. It really was to hide itself. So it was not an open field tank. A different type of conversation, if you will. Um, another way to play this too, as I'm thinking this out loud, another way to play this as well is to really study Iraq War, Gulf War stuff, all the colorways that are similar to the really pale Dunkelgelbs, and then start applying those things one to one as well. Because even even a Humvee weathering is applicable to the colorway of what's going on with, say, a pure yellow. Dunkelgelb um, type conversation. So there's ways to play it. Even, even Desert Africa Corps, really look at modern desert warfare stuff and you can really see how a lot of how the tires look, you know, and, you know, all that kind of stuff for scout cars and for armored cars and stuff between the wars. You can you can do a lot of those things too to, to cross uh, promote stuff. Okay. Let's see, hopefully. Um, Drew asked Mike, what is your favorite build you've done? I'm sure it's hard to choose. My favorite build. Let me think for a minute. It, it it's still it's going to be between the JSU one twenty two, um, the D nine Dozer. Um, I got pigments all over the place. Uh, D nine Dozer, the forty eight scale pack wagon. Um, mostly on the paint job on that one. I do like the Sazabi. It was, it was kind of a, a, I felt it was a bit of an accomplishment in terms of coming over and, and trying to get stuff done. I think it achieved the goals I was after and so I really like it for that reason. Uh, really trying to show a military type paint job on a, on a, on a, on a gunpla. I could do this all day. I wonder if I could do a little juice this up. So the JS 122, um, and I don't know if any of the missing link dudes are in here today. I don't see, I haven't seen Darren in a minute. Um, what happened on that one? The reason I that was the one where it all kind of came together, you know, the OPR and the hairspray chipping and all that. So I'm speckling the light dust color into the tread. This is just another, you can see why this is, this is to me, in my opinion, one of the more underrated techniques out there. Speckling is just, you can see how I control I get, how close I get to this, just need a little bit of the oils. And then back on that 122, it was, it's the, to me a 152 kit, and I had the, the, had all the correct parts to convert it to a 122, which I'd saved for a Dragon project, um, but that model had come out. And if you don't know the story of, of the, of, of, to me as 
JS2, is it the, is it a 2M? God, it's been a minute since I looked at that box art. And then the, the ISU 152, um, same conversation we've had recently with the, with the people, uh, the gentlemen that go around to the various museums and they measure stuff. They measure the, the museum pieces for sale to the model kit companies. And I had an insider at Dragon that, and, and it's an old enough story, it probably doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> you know, you probably wouldn't want me saying 10, 10 years ago. But they pitched the sale of that data to Dragon to redo their kits because they had all the JS2, ISU, ISUs, IS2s, JS, however you want to say it. Uh, I know my Russian friends like it when I say IS for the, the spelling. But anyway, um, they, they said no. So that's when, if you remember, the orange box stuff came out where they re-kitted with a little, with a few updates, some of their older kits, Dragon did. So the dude that had that data sold it to Tamiya. And that's how Tamiya got those kits done. That's why they're the JS2 and the um, the 152 came at the same time. But I had the 122 parts. I had the barrel and the mantlet. I think it was a CMK kit, CMK resin turned aluminum barrel. Pretty rare too. I think it was out of production by the time that came out. So I modified that, fitted it to the the, the Tamiya kit, Tamiya kit. However you guys like to say that. I say to me, LA, we always said to me, uh, um, yeah. Oh, and that's how that happened. But it was a highly successful hairspray slash OPR. So it's, 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 it's definitely up there. Um, the D9 Dozer, also like, like 8 million layers of hairspray chipping on that one. That one came out really good. I was pretty happy with that one. And then the little 48 scale pack wagon was really cool. It's one of my favorites. Cause that one followed, that was the one the D9R, the Armored Dozer, which is the Varja Miniatures resin version of that kit, well before Mang produced their kit, which is far superior uh, in detail and stuff like that. Uh, War Pig, which is the actual Marine, US Marine one that I used. I just didn't put War Pig on the, on the, on the banner up top. Uh, I was really happy with that because it, it matched the reference photos pretty well. And then the, the little, um, the pack wagon, the 251-22 uh, pack wagon, that matches a bunch of reference photos uh, really nicely, and I was really happy with how that came out. So those are those are up there for sure. I don't have like a pure favorite though. Um, so Marino's unpopular opinion says I like large sparse areas on models. Okay, I'm with you. I get it. Um, yeah, the D9R was. Uh, oh my God, kill me now. Still at work. Uh, Corey, what's up, brother? Uh, what's up, kids? Dookie, pick up the phone. <laughs> how you doing, man? Um, yeah, I'm happy for you though, Zal. I can see the improvement in your work, Zal, so you're doing some good stuff. Um, Jess Naughton says, for something like, like this wheel, what is the advantage of oils over an enamel product? Um, they're both solvent-based. There is no real advantage per se, other than the fact that I probably have a little bit more controllability with my color palette. I can get more creative with it. You know, you're, if you're using four or five open bottles of pre-thin weathering enamels, it's just half a dozen one, six of another. I prefer this process. Um, the oils, there's no smell, there's no bullshit. Um, easy to work with. Personally, the cleanup's easier. I mean, there's a number of reasons why you go oil versus enamel. It's just, they, that holds true across everything now. It's the same concept. Um, oh, da, 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 da. Okay, I think I caught up, okay. So that's just quickly putting that on the tire. Yeah, yeah I, I dissed all my enamels a long time ago, so it's not even for me, not even, I mean, it's just, it is what it is. I just chose to go to oils. I just, I just think they're superior. And like I've said before, if you haven't heard this part of it though, um, with the oils, the core of this is um, just between, um, so you have your pre-thin weathering enamels in the, in there, that's a pre-thin mixture in the bottle. That locks you into a certain zero to 100. It's, it's probably like a 20%. You can go as thin as you want, but you're, you're kind of losing that top opacity. The oil paints go zero to 100 all the time in any colorway I want. So I have that flexibility and it's imminently more powerful when you're working on it. When you're working out of the bottles where you, you're trying to do, you're either gonna have to pre-mix something over on the side of like a recipe, which is what I used to do. I used to take I used to take all the, um, before the AK stuff, there was a bunch of the weathering effects from, from these guys. And I would take a half empty bottle and I would start just putting the grays in and the tans in and the browns and I would have this like whole crazy recipe. Because the problem you have with that, Jess, is that you're locked into that colorway a little bit unless you have like five of them and you're using all these different bottles. Well, the other part of that is it just effing stinks. Like it just stinks, stinks. It's like the whole place, even in a vented room, it's just, it's terrible. Your models smell like this stuff. I hated it after point, after 10 years of enamels. I'm like, okay, cool. Because when you go to the oils and you realize they don't smell, like, oh, 
That's nice. And they're just as blendable. In fact, they're the most blendable of all the chemicals. So the power is up there. That's what it is. It's kind of that. It's like, a, it's like there, and there's the acrylic wash conversation, but that's a drying time thing. So you have to work faster, probably smaller. Um, it's, again, it's, it's more of just a personal preference. And so that was what was determining why I chose to switch from enamels to the oils. And hopefully that answered that question. All right, so now we've got a set of blackened metal tracks. In this case, we did this back on the track show where I, did, I didn't do anything with this run here. Um, it's the old school pinched together frill model set. It's just a test set. You see that little, there you can see that right there. See that? So there's, there's, a, there's a link built into this side. And then you take, uh, there's that little pull apart there. You see that? You have to crimp those down. So these old crimp style tracks, these are ancient. This is probably mid 80s, early 90s uh, set of tracks. But anywho, they're blackened and they're ready to go. So let me back myself up. Let's go light to dark. We'll put some dust down because it's a dust episode. So let's stay dusty McNusty. So say we didn't want to use pigments on this. Say these are spares on the, on the tank. They're, they're going to be used for spare tracks on the tank or whatever. little bit of really really thin like a dust wash but I would say too also the brush application is all kind of the same so between enamels and oils so that you can still pick up a lot of technique uh, with with unloading on the paper towel and all this kind of stuff so that's that's the value I guess it would be if you if you have a lot of those those um, bottled products and you don't want to you know ditch them or anything like that which I'm not recommending you do although kind of am but <laughs> close your ears Rick you didn't hear that but yeah, no, I mean, that's kind of, you're, you're gonna, you'll find if, if you work mostly with oils and you've come from enamels, the, the lack of odors is, is <laughs> underrated. It's like, dude, it's like so nice. Like this is a year round process. Like I don't have to sweat anything. But for me, what's happened too is the development of, of, of the oils and, and my use of them is, over the time is, is, um, is the, the, the tonal adjustments I have with this palette like this whole little like the, the way I can work so fast through this um, to kind of put stuff like right now I've got here's to take a little bit of orange a little bit of burnt uh, I'm not sorry a little bit of yellow ochre a little bit of orange put that around the base of those um, those guide teeth kind of a light dusty rust color in there a little bit of a surface rust So you can see how quickly, just I'm leaving this open so you can kind of see just the hand work, the brush work. Like when you're when you're just kind of grabbing, I want just you just grab the colors you want, you go. There's no smell, there's no whatever. A little bit of thinner right here. It's a very efficient system. This will make all the products last forever. Excuse me, there is a value to it. So if you're concerned about price and money, you're limited. It's a very, very probably the most efficient weathering in terms of cost structure. So I'm just laying down some dust, a little yellow ochre, a little orange, kind of a faded, rusty, dusty, kind of blend it right there on the palette. Now grab some, I'm just showing you just the power of this and when you really want to go. So I'm now I'm throwing down a little bit of, of, of uh, burnt sienna. That's too wet. A little bit of orange, a little bit of burnt sienna right on top of the dust, all wet application still. It's right on the tracks. I'll zoom back in. I'm just showing you just brushwork, why, why it's just, not to sell it or anything like that, but just to, to kind of illustrate kind of what happens of why this is such a nice system to work with. And remember, I did a decade of enamels before I switched to this too. So it's not like I don't um, have a place in my heart for all the, the hard work that came out of all that stuff. And they're all in the books. A lot of the tank art books have the, have the earlier work that have a lot of the enamel uh, weathering too, like the, the, the Hetzer and Tank Art 1 is the ambush scheme one. That's all enamel weathering products and stuff like that. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other one. The um, I want to say the Desert uh, Panzer IV has a lot of that. I don't think it has a lot of oil. I don't remember it having a lot of oils. Uh, the Tiger one is a transition between enamel and oil, so you can kind of compare the two, the early part of that chapter, and you can kind of see the transition. We talked about that a little bit earlier today, and then what else? Um, 
the Tiger 2 and Tank Art 4, uh, all the effects on the pigments down low are, I believe, all enamel-based AK products. The AMX 30 in Modern Armor 3 has a lot of uh, AK's enamel rust uh, stuff they introduced at the time, I think I used. Um, and then uh, I'm trying to think what else. Okay, I'm just trying to. So, yeah, there's there's a whole conversation of, in, in, in just the progression of stuff. So, let's zoom back in. Zoom, zoom. Okay, let me zoom, zoom. So, that's showing you kind of the, the how fast that goes and how quickly you, you adjust on that. So these are what the tones look like that have been applying from three feet away. Now let's dry them and see what happens. Is this going to change dramatically? So with the tracks, you can get away with a little bit of a, of a rusty tone to that. why I like the burnishing part so much. Okay, so hold on, we're not done yet though. So now just stippling with the thinner a little bit. So this is kind of a light, exposed, arid, dusty. I'm trying to get that camera to see that. Yeah, so there you go, get a little bit of that. So also what I like about that is the way the oils diffuse out too. They're a little, the pigment grind's a little bit superior in the oil paint versus the enamel paint. So you get a little bit softer transition. You, it's good, it's better for smaller scales as well. Uh, so that's another advantage that you have with the oil. It's not much, but it is noticeable at times. Uh, retail sucks, I, I need a new gig. I sell, <laughs> I swear. What's wrong, Corey? You haven't, you haven't, uh, uh, bad day, but man, Joe Bringa says, okay, boys, gotta go. Great stream. You're welcome, Joe. Take care, man. We'll talk soon. TJ, I feel like my pigments are getting better just while working on them while watching that. Okay, sweet, sweet, sweet. Yeah, I imagine you'll, you'll, uh, um, you'll go fast. Yeah, what I was trying to show Pete was kind of, I, I pulled out so you can see kind of my hand dancing through the palette a little bit and, and all that kind of stuff. That was, that was why I was doing that mic and everybody, because Jess had asked that question. What I was trying to show you guys was, is the hand work on the color palette from up over on the on the thing which is way out of frame so i wasn't trying to do that on purpose other than just so you can watch my hands move around and dance through the colors because that's the conversation of why i moved from enamels to oils because that little palette there is, is so uh so nice that's what i was doing so don't sweat it i got you that wasn't a, a, a mistake um yeah and that's what i was so that's what i was yeah so 40 foot that's what he yeah so you, that's what i was doing there yeah you got that uh, just that for the boss, I'm going to do old school dry brush and wash there. <laughs> yeah, you could do whatever you want, pal. Nobody, nobody really cares. But I mean, you get it. Yeah. Okay. And it's a good question though, Jess, because there's a lot of people out there that still buy in a lot of stuff. Um, did I answer your question though, Deadlab? Did that answer you as well? Uh, if you're still there, because it's probably late. <laughs> um, also watch previous videos. Okay. okay. So, uh, now I'm trying to open questions. Um, yeah. My favorite Gunpla mobile suit design, though, is the, is the Dom series. So if that, uh, yeah. So now, let me, let me reset this. Okay, that's as zoomed in as I can go, and then I can probably lower it out a little bit. Take one of those off, give me a little bit more. Okay, that's a pretty powerful zoom in. A little zoom, zoom, let me switch. I need a shorty brush here. So I remember I got these guys the other day. Just got a few in. Just wanted to see because they have a they have a they have a short um, length of handle here. You can see there. Not at well. <laughs> it's not as dramatic as it looks, right? Um, I guess I can kind of jam that in. What I was trying to do is 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 look at that and see what happens. Just to have a few of them. There, I'm zoomed back in. <laughs> Okay, brand new brush. Let me get some thinner in that. So what I'm going to do now, so on the track conversation, now what I like to do is you come back in. So a little bit more of a um, next tone up, but to um, 
what I was trying to do is in two different, so this is kind of a nice comparison is, is what I'm, what I'm liking is right in here, this kind of embedded dust into the steel is kind of the same look I was trying to go for right there, which is, which is the same technique, same processes. So it's, that worked out really well. I'm happy. I'm a happy camper. So like the tires, I come back in, I do a little bit more opacity on some of these. Now you can go link to link and you can kind of this, you really have an ability to play with this now because when you do that kind of a, a thin washed application like that, kill some of this a little bit too powerful there. So I'm just taking a little bit of dust color and just kind of knocking that yellow down a, just a tad. I like the surface rust look, so I don't want to come back in too much and mess with that, but I did want to kill some of that there. Just so it's a little bit, yeah. That yellow ochre is a little bit, you can come in here with a little, a little brown, just a tint of rust to that. A little bit of a blender here. Tracks and tires and stuff like that. The beauty of these, uh, working on these is, is you can, you can just be ham fisted. You know, you don't have to be as precise or as delicate or anything of the sort. I like that aspect about them. It really, really makes for a nice. Oh my gosh. I've had that multiple times tonight. Like it's either too much pain or too little. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Give me some love. I'm just taking this, I'm just gonna kind of rusty out this one link here on its own, a little bit more of a dark red rust. But you, you're able to achieve these kind of variations between us by laying that light dust layer down first and then I threw in some um, pale rust colors into that. That's how you achieve that kind of fresh surface rust look. Hold on here, I got a, a rant bristle. There we go. A little fingernail clipper. Brush as good as new. Okay. So what I'm trying to do here is just kind of give you a little variation between the... So I'm using some of my darker browns. Brand new brushes, you do have to kind of, you will notice you have to work them in a little bit. The bristles are, they have kind of a, it's almost like, it's almost like a, a resin kit where you've got a little like a mold release on it or whatever. Do I like the Transformers? Like, do I like Michael Bay Transformers? Or do I like just the, the, the anime Transformers? They're okay. I mean, I grew up with Transformers, you know, I grew up with them. It's not my, not my total thing. I have a lot of issues with, <laughs> I have a lot of personal issues, my friends. It's time to get real. Uh, I have a lot of problems with the machine that can molecularly change its color and then gets chipped paint. <laughs> Don't make no sense to me, but Michael Bay wants to beat the shit out of these things and show them beat up and chipped and rusted as they fight. And I don't understand how that happens. Like, does a robot actively chip its own paint visually just to look like it's chipped paint? <laughs> Is that what's going on? Tell you, tell you what, the suspension of disbelief of Transformers is, is, is on the border for me. I would say, in fact, in fact, too, my least favorite Gunpla or Gundam designs are the ones, the, the ones I don't like the transforming robots. The ones that go from spaceship to to robot are not my favorite Gundams either. So, yeah. Like, if you're just gonna make me a big robot that handles a big gun, then that's just what it is. I don't need it to do other things. Okay, so what I'm doing here is just so I've got that darker link. So what? So imagine. So the reason this is important. Let me let me let me let me get my head back on. Oh, I can just use a cover photo here. Actually, the reason this is important is because a lot of times the spare track conversation on armor, uh, especially World War II armor, um, you could really make your like if you want to like the difference between a silver and a gold to me is oftentimes how you treat and and, and take the time 
to do all the smaller details and I, and I treat this like a full on model right there. Uh, and that's what I'm doing right now is I'm putting the time in and I would probably have actual good rust tracks up or, or old tracks up on screen in front of me. Uh, but I'm doing an okay job with this. But this is to, to, sh to talk about what I'm doing and, and, and get back to get back to the task at hand. <laughs> Can't get back to what you're doing, my friend. So I'm coming in here and I'm just taking a couple of these links and I'm adding just between dust color and rust color and kind of just building up going between a little bit of an orange with a little bit of a tan parched parched what is today guys Wednesday what are we doing there's nothing on Wednesdays all right now I got videos I'll probably do work on some patreon stuff tonight actually because I got the rig set up so I might as well keep going Yeah, I do have concerns about the, the about the time commitments of all this stuff going on. It's got me nervous. So all I'm going to do is just kind of I'm just going through these tracks a little bit and just kind of slightly giving them all a little bit. I'm using a little bit of my dust in here, a little bit of the of the browns, a little bit of the rust tones. Because this is this is the difference maker. If, if this is going to sit on the exposed surface of, of the back of a tank or the side of a tank, Staying. we should get the new iPhone here maybe next week. By the way, too. I did get the return kit in the mail today for the iPhone 12, so for this guy, so that means that the regular phone is probably only a few days away now. So what I'm doing now is, or what I've done here, is just kind of slightly come through and, and, and punched a few of these up with different colorways just to break them up just a little bit. Let's see if I do some pencils next. Once that dries, it actually comes, it really comes out quite nice. So just adding a bit of the patina and surface rust into those track sets right there. So again, this would be exposed like this on the on the exterior of a tank, you know, as, as spare track armor. You know, you would, you would you would put these. It would be this conversation back here with this guy. It's that kind of stuff. So that's that's actually what I've been doing, or what it's for. spares back here. Yeah, that's a good look right there. You can kind of see the the, the the dusty tones in there, then the mix with the various rust and stuff. So that's that's a pretty solid play right there. I'd be happy with that. I'd definitely be happy with that. Here do this one real just show you guys real quick. So this is the other set from the Stug with the Winter Ketten. So we'll do a little spares on that. Um, and going back at it. Okay, have a good have a good stream. You got it, Corey. Uh, we'll talk soon, brother. Have a good one. Uh, back to the chance, uh, running down the dream. <laughs> right. Uh, like Macross too. Macross is cool. Um, yeah, they, they, I haven't talked about Macross because I just don't have anything from them, uh, kit wise. And they're expensive kits. They're not like cheap twenty dollar kits. You know, they're fifty, sixty, seventy dollars, and I just haven't got the, the thing up to go get them. Yep, we'll catch you later, Dead Love. Have a good night. Guten Nacht. Okay. All right, cool. Okay, so we got a little bit of this here. Same idea. Just throw down a quick little dust wash right there. Boom, done. So I'm just getting my dust color. Same idea. No big deal here. No big thing, chicken wings. And you can go as even or as random as you want with your spare tracks and stuff of this nature. I tend to go a little bit more uneven wear and tear in colorways because sometimes I like to think, well, maybe they replace two, three links here, then they put back together three or four links there. And you know, I like to make up little stories with my spare tracks so that I can kind of get a little bit more of an interesting. It's not nothing. I'm not trying to be hyperactive. It's a little bit more on the artistic side, a little bit more of a of a free 
uh, rain to kind of come in here and, and, and do what you want with them. That's kind of why it's kind of how I treat them. I do like to put a little bit of the, the, the yellow ochre or like a pale orange into the dust. Kind of a light surface rust, embedded dust, rusty color way. And you can use your little stipler. The, the light glare is catching that. You're not really seeing the color way on this as well as I hope. So I'll just kind of stipple that, soften that up a little bit. A little stipple action. Again, this is for oil work, not pigment work. Dry that up real quick. So get that light down, get that dry. dust layer application in there. A little bit more of a punchy orange. Kind of a surface rust oxidation look. These are these are going to be mostly a steel track and some of these, you know, some of these have some other alloys and stuff in them, but their surface rust will be steel sometimes. So you will get this. Just depends, you know, you gotta do your research. I'm not really trying to be uh, anything other than show you techniques tonight. The trick with the oils on the tracks is just get a, a little bit enough thinner in there you get that diffused soft look. Yeah, just add a little tiny, little real thin bits of like rusty surface layers on this a little bit. A little bit of a surface rust to it. But wet there. Get this a good dry. Nine to every time. Is it? It's 6.03 for me. We'll wrap it up here in a little bit. What time did we start? Three? Okay. Lightly burnish and, and polish the uh, the guy teeth if you're going to put these on the tank. Doesn't take much. I'm just using a thousand grit. This brings out. That's the beauty of metal tracks. And if you wanted to, make sure it was a little bit after. Just taking the edge of the the pad and just running them down the. Where the road wheels go, I don't go full blown on this. I just kind of knock it just as a, like a pathway. Just kind of give it like a little bit of a wear spot through there. So you'll get some of that oil, you get some of the embedded dust that's still stuck in the nooks, in, 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 the, in the small, in the lower parts or whatever, how do you say it? We say nooks and crannies in the little uh, depressions. 
you know, if you don't speak uh, English or anything like that, that's fine. Yeah, I'm not saying. Okay, done with that. All right, let's, let's try this. Let me get with my water. Do. All right, so I've had a few comments on the pencil conversation. I don't have exactly the best dust colors in this pencil set. It's an art set. It's not a weathering set. So we're, we're going to, it's a watercolor pencil set uh, from King Art. I just went ahead and purchased it just to test them out. Let me get all my oil paint brushes out of here. I got a lot of good greens. The glare is a little bit, the camera glare, sorry. Let me see if I can adjust this just a touch. You might get a little bit of a different angle off of this now, but. Okay. That way the camera glare doesn't blow out the colors as much. Um, but let me, let me see what I can do here. No guarantees this goes well. I need some blenders. I need, what do I need? I need uh, a little stipple jimmy jam. Use this guy. Um, let's see here where he is. I've noticed with the pencil conversation with the blending part, um, you need a little bit more of a, of a stout bristle. So I'm using more of the shader side brushes, the square red edged rake brushes. I'm gonna try this here. The longer number twos don't work, didn't work as well, I noticed. So I'm switching over a little bit to more for blending here. Okay, let me, let me grab some pencils here. Yeah, they don't really have desaturated colors as much as you would hope for, so it's a conversation I've had with them uh, in terms of, hey, you guys should add some of that stuff. Um, but we'll see. Let's see. Okay. I have an electric pencil sharpener. See how loud that is. That is probably the power of the hobby is its ability to, um, get the microphone over here. it's the power of the hobby to connect the dots uh, between everybody. It's really nice. Uh, it's Korean. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't read the kanji on your name there. I wish I knew what you, what, what, what should we call you in English? My friend uh, from Korea, uh, if you have a, uh, an English name, just scrolling back up real quick. Uh, Lich for I love Transformers. I love Gundam, but I don't love Transformers. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I'm not a big fan of Transforming robots in general. Derek Slicing got G1 all the way. Damn, I never thought about that question. What about MG Gundam? Did you order again? Uh, Michael Vice. I'm sorry, I missed that question. So he asks, uh, what Master Grade Gundam did you order again? My Master Grade coming in um, was a Dewage, which I already have. D W A D G E. It's a Dom variant. Uh, it's expensive. It's a P Bandai kit. It's about 100, 150 US, depends. Uh, I was lucky. I got mine for 88 plus, like 20 bucks shipping. So it's right around $100 for me to get that in. Uh, I got the shipping notice this, uh, this morning that my Nightingale high grade is coming in from a USA Gundam store, which means I'm guessing the high new real grade is a week or two behind. Um, so those are going to be my new other, other new kits got coming in uh, in terms of Gunpla. Have not, I've got a couple armor kits coming in. Uh, I've got some 70 second scale armor kits that showed up. I've got uh, big FedEx delays in Portland with stuff. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. <clears throat> yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. Um, sweet. Okay, so the watercolor conversation. 
watercolor pencil conversation, sorry. Kind of watercolors, I mean, it's an interesting situation here. Um, conversation, how they work. So this is just regular little tap water. Little, I'm trying to get everything on camera for you. Um, got the turret here in green. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay down, let me think this through a little bit. So I've got dust, this is old work here. <laughs> it's very old work, very, very old. The old, let's go, let me, let me, let me see if we can get some light green on this hatch first and see how this goes. So I've only done watercolor pencil work a few times, a couple of times. So you, what you do is you get the pencil, there's actually cured watercolor and you can see how it changes the tip right away. You wipe that out on the paper towel. Kind of get it kind of a wet. Okay, everybody see everything? Okay, cool. Get that down on the surface a little bit. It's kind of half drawn, half painting. And as the pencil kind of breaks in and get the watercolor gets a little wet, it becomes a little bit more malleable. So I'm trying to fade the, the, the hatch up here first. Uh, the beauty of this is it's real precise work. You know, it's 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 uh, it goes where you want it to, that whole thing. And it's easy to fix and correct anything if you if you get it wrong. Uh, I'm not trying to be historically accurate. I'm just trying to show you techniques with this because I don't have all the these, these are real bright colors. But we'll show you layered stuff. I'm just kind of scruffily getting that down on the surface a little bit in here, and I'll show you what I'm going to do with this. And then we'll try this brush first. It's a little, um, it's a little chisel blender, number two chisel blender. Kind of come in here and stipple this a little bit. I actually think there's a lot of there's a lot of ability in, in in these products. I just haven't really spent time with them too much. So, for those of you that were curious, you have the AK sets and all that stuff. This is kind of the same, and it's literally dry almost immediately. And that's a, that's a pretty cool look right there. I have to be honest with you. I, I like the results I get. The colors off. So again, I'm not trying to be accurate to a T34 or 4BO or anything of the sort. This is this is just working with the tools to show you guys what I'm talking about. So see how I use the brush and I kind of stipple that and soften that up. Let's zoom in a little bit. So it definitely has a different look to it than the oils, but it's, it's in the same idea where you're putting the color down and then you're blending. And that's kind of my interpretation of how you're going to get some of the better results from this. And then what we can do is, again, I'm going to layer some colors up here. I'm going to take a dark green here. It's, it's, it's olive green. Yeah, I'm like, we're not gonna go with the pencil. It's a little bit confusing on the pencil names because what I think olive green is. <laughs> so the first green was May green. May green, because it may be not green. No, it's fine. Beautiful pencils though, they're gorgeous. I love the wood, the, the, the raw wood. Okay, so wet the, wet the tip in the water again. So what I'm gonna try to do now, I've got a, oops, sorry, zoom, zoom. So this is now switched to a darker green color here. Let's see if I can get some. Tried some layer effects in here. So what I'm trying to do is kind of darken around the hatch thing now, a little bit like a pen wash in a way. Kind of a reverse colorway here. Where we're going a little bit light to dark. To just kind of get it in there a little bit. And then the brush again, switch that over. You can blend those two colors together. Yeah, you do some pretty cool stuff with it. Darker around here. Kind of a little bit of a coffee shake, get a little bit of kind of a scruffy, scratchy look in there. Come back in with the 
the stipple brush. Kind of tap that a little bit, get that going. Kind of an interesting effect for sure. Get this guy. What color is this way? Okay. So I grabbed a black and a burnt umber. Uh, the nice thing is they dry a dead mat. So that's cool. So this is the burnt umber, like a dark, dark brown. Going around the edge of that hatch a little bit. Kind of scuffing that up. You know, like the crew would scuff that up. Take the blender brush. Now the nice thing about this is this, this process actually goes very, very fast. Um, when you get good with this and so you can see how I've kind of got the, say this is, now again, this is not trying to be 4 bo green, but the concept is kind of a lighter hatch, fade it out, and then kind of where the crew's gonna be messing with things. Oh, oops, wrong one. I want the darker brown, sorry. But I can layer in a little bit of kind of a light, like a, this is just a brown, kind of maybe like a rust tone. Lay that down. So I kind of lay that, lay that down right there kind of layer chip that rust out and then come back in with a darker tone on top. You leave a little bit of that light orange ex exposed. So you can see how I did kind of a layered paint chip right there. <laughs> kind of a little bit of a rusty layered chip. This would be really good for a bandit. This would be really good for a civilian. Um, it's a really artistic look. So if you really like your, your paintwork, color modulation, that kind of stuff, um, I can see there's a lot of potential here. So I do, I do uh, uh, what should we do here? Should we call you bro? <laughs> Keep going. No. Um, uh, so there, yeah. So let me come back in here. Kinda just just kind of add in a little bit of a, like a layer of discoloration on top of that pale green a little bit. Same principles as I use on the other you know, bits of, of teaching today. It's kind of light to dark. It's not really a dust. I don't really have a dust color, uh, but what we'll try to do here is, is, is do some stuff over here. So then you just kind of use the water as your thinner. Same idea. Unload it. So, you're, so my blending brush has is, is got some water, but it's, it's, um, it's not soaking wet. It's a little damp. But you will reactivate the color below, so you do have to kind of be careful with that. It's a little bit like how oils and enamels will have the same kind of principle where, where if you're not careful and you've, you've added thinners and, and stuff like that, you'll, you will reactivate some stuff. It's pretty cool though, you get some neat stuff going. Let's see, let's see if I can do this here. Let's see, this color here, let me get a little white. Get like a chartreuse kind of a thing here. Let me see if this will work. Let me see if I can get kind of, so I've got a little of this pale yellow here. It's kind of a yellowy, it's kind of a dusty color a little bit. Got to let that water kind of. And then take some. So same, I'm trying to recreate a little bit of a dust here with yellows and whites on the greens. So it's a little bit of a, of a kind of just being a color dude here. Just kind of putting a little bit of like a dusty bit. And that's only because I don't have like really nice beige tan color pencils and stuff. So the white kind of tricks your eye a little bit. A little bit. So I do have this color. I don't really use this color yet. This is a, just a cool gray. It's like a light gray. Let's see what this does. I don't know if it'll cut the. The only hard part I've been finding is, is really getting to really run like a pin wash would run a little bit.
you know, so if you try to do stuff around details and stuff. It's kind of a gentle stipple. You see that yellow blends into the green a little bit and starts to go a little bit on the, on the bright side. That's okay. Like in fact, to be truthful, that was, that would be a nice color hatch for a T62 or a T72 that had that really really you know T55, um, that kind of Russian faded colorway you know where those where those greens go like like almost neon yellow some of them, so it's definitely potential, uh, and then of course all the civilian stuff you know this would be great for a Zaku you know any kind of thing like that where there's a lot of you know kind of unspecific colorways, you know if you have just a basic color pencil set. Let's see if I can do this over here on this side now. Maybe I'll try a little bit of white first this time. Could be good for like whitewashes and stuff like that too. And now let me use my ooh, ooh, ooh. get back here. <laughs> I elbowed that dude out of the way. So I switched a little like a like a light burnt sienna. Kind of blend in the white with the tan a little, kind of get like a light. Trying to get a tan out of this. Kind of blending up, kind of kind of mixing like a mad scientist over here to get kind of a light, dusty color. And I think this is mainly just because I don't have the exact colors I want and, and just trying to figure out the blendability of these guys. So now this is the, the love that you get now. It's just like the oils, same idea. Come in here and you just kind of blend it with the wet brush. You get some, there's some, getting some nice looks there now. And that's, that's when it starts to come out. And they dry almost instantly. Um, they don't handle uh, direct touching very well. So it's a little bit like a pigment. Uh, I, I've heard you can varnish over these without too much trouble. Like you won't lose too much of the color integrity. I'm sure you lose a little bit. Okay, so here. That doesn't actually look half bad. That's pretty cool, actually. It's kind of neat. I'm just gonna come in here. So I'm on the panel line now. Kind of wearing around the, the edge there, kind of blend the two sections up. It's good for like just edge chipping, like where you just need a little bit of like a colorway, you know, paint wear off. So you get some cool, so you get some neat effects. Same same work, principles work, light to dark. You know, you can come in here. Okay, let's go switch the other way. Oops, I got a little mushy there. Get off. Got a big piece of pencil chunk there. So again, I'm gonna just lighten up the edge a little bit here. We're gonna do kind of a layered chip edge here. Watch what we do here, same idea. I'm gonna go a little bit more artsy, illustrated, scruffy, not really care. Do a little yellow on that too. Again, this isn't trying to be accurate or any color accuracy or anything like that. I'm just trying to show techniques here. Show how these work or what you can do with them. So now we switch to the, the blending brush again. Actually, let me switch to the mop here. Oh, damn it, didn't mean to do that. <clears throat> a little bit, little bit bigger blender here, a little bit more of a soft stipple. The 
the camera does give that a little bit more neon pump to it. It's not quite as neon green on, but it is close. <laughs> Yeah, you can get these to, to liquefy pretty good. Depends on how much water you put down. So what I'm doing though is I'm going to do a layered paint, paint chip here in a sec here. Hold on. There is a plan, my friend. It's actually it's actually working pretty well. Kind of keep working a little bit as it dries. So I'm guessing you guys with the AK sets have a lot more um, colorway choices that are desaturated. Okay. Oh, actually, here, let me do this first. Okay, now I switch to a dark green. Yeah, once the water kind of really activates the tip, then it takes a minute to kind of... So now I come in here with the dark green, a little bit more precise. Kind of, kind of dry, like a dry brush in, come in here. Do a little bit more of a scuffy, scruffy, scruffy around that. Dry brush that edge a little bit. Kind of a scruffy, scruffy little. So it's kind of a worn, chipped edge a little bit. I dropped it. Soften that up with the blender brush, come in, tighten that up. Yeah, I can see there's, there's some definite potential uses here. Because it gives the gives the the look of the model. The one thing I do like, color accuracy aside, um, chunk of pencil right there. Uh, gives kind of a really nice, kind of cool illustration kind of look to it, which is neat. So now what I'm going to do is, um, I'm not sure how you treat these like pigments. Can't paint straight. Nobody can straight paint straight. Uh, what do we got here? A little burnt umber. Okay, so now let's. Dry brush, or kind of the same idea, dry brushing again, running the edge of that pencil just along the, the hot spots with the dark brown, kind of a worn steel look. What did I just do? It does take a minute for the for the water to kind of get that the tip of the pencil to activate. Now I mix kind of a dark brown edge to that. Blending brush, kind of just soft, soften that a little bit. It does match up quite well with the other paintwork, so I do like that fact about it. You know, you're not. It doesn't look like so much like a pencil once you blend it out with the with the brush. It does take some of the pencil marks down, so you can see we got a little bit of the dark steel edge right here, a little bit of a dark kind of brownish green to that edge there, the hatch. You know, color ac again, color accuracy a little bit off, but that's just because of the, the pencil colors I've got. You 
and it is it is a watercolor so then if you if you wanted to you can then put any other type of uh, solvent chemical on top yeah yeah so there's a little bit of kind of uh intro to watercolor pencil 101 you know you got a little bit of going on there a little bit of interesting effects through that little section right there you know if this was a t-34 that was you know still around in 1950s you know you've got that kind of faded russian green i mean this is you could argue this a little bit so it's not too bad that's pretty cool actually <laughs> kind of neat um you know it just kind of depends on what you what you're going for what you're trying to do get some stuff all over me all right any final questions um yeah there's a few videos around on what on the weathering pencils i mean there's they, they were more kind of older when they first came out um there's a lot more power to them. I'm, I'm kind of guessing um, as I play with them here. I'm kind of clean up my station here as a mess. <laughs> a little crazy, uh, but they would be um, they would be um, very efficient. Like if you were traveling and you just had a bundle of pencils and you just need some water and, and a paper towel. I mean, and you had the model of the you know, say you're just kind of doing whatever. So they're efficient in the sense that they're very um, transportable. Watercolor pencils are completely non-toxic. Um, you know, so I so I do think there's there's some some wins there. Uh, for, you know, especially you know kids or younger models or whatever like that. You want real like crayons the whole thing. It's in that conversation. I did make a mess of my hands here. I don't know why I got the. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do get. If you get too much water around on them, and that tip kind of starts to, there's like a moment where the water actually activates them pretty good. And there's a little wax in them. You can feel there's a little bit of wax in them. Um, what else? Anything else? Am I missing anything else? Yeah, let me do a little bit more. Taking some dark green here and just kind of, kind of like a speckle. Just like tapping that pencil tip in that green a little bit just to kind of. I do like them. I think there's definitely something there. It'd be cool to do a model this way just to see the difference. They're they're capable enough that I would I would be willing to, to do that a little bit, you know. This is this has definitely got some power for you know let's say you know here it's again the camera does make it more look more neon. It's not quite as potent, but it's still pretty loud. But I like the fact that because it's dead matte like this, you could you could definitely go right to pigments over it. You can do other stuff. I'm sure the, I don't know what the waxiness, how good the oils would take to it, but I've got it right here. We can try some in a second, then we'll, we'll wrap up here on, on stream here in the end. So just stippling that out a little bit there. Tones it down. That, this brush kind of picks up a little. This brush is probably a little bit better for this. But again, these are all brand new brushes. So a lot of times these brushes need the bristles to be worked in before they really start to come alive. So that kind of cut it down. It's still a little bit bright, but they're a little bit translucent, which is cool. And the translucency is, you know, when you're dealing with, with all this kind of paint work, weathering work, faded paint, uh, you're, you're your best work happens when you're getting the transparency and the translucency of the pass through of, of the, you know, between opacity in terms of opaque, you know, solid color versus, you know, the, the, the lower level spray paint color coming through. That's the power. That's what you're seeing here. If you saw what I did was I applied that, that faded green around the edges there a little bit and left kind of the, the base color through this and, and kind of that's when I blended it. Same up over here, you know, kind of creates that transparency effect. Uh, and then you come back in with the, with the darker thing. So they are, they're efficient, they're fast, you know, speed wise, you can really hustle. I can tell, you know, I can, you can see how quick I've got this going. So now I'm taking a little bit of dark color on top, a little bit of dark green to wear the edges off. Kind of like, just like, seem like with the dry brushing. You know, you kind of scruff that little, you know, it's, 
you don't have to be like a perfect artist to work with these. You know, just kind of, you can just, it's just kind of a little scribble scratch. Chicken scratch it. It kind of scuffs it up a little bit. Just a little bit. Of, so I'm working with what, two or three colors right now. Same idea, same, it's all the same principles, you know. I'm kind of layering up my colors. Let's see how black the let's see how dark the black goes here. Let's use the black raw. So if you need that sharp edge like that, you can really, you know, the pencil does give you that nice precision. I've never varnished over them, so I don't, you know, if you have to seal these for, for like, this is a, this would be a conversation where technically these watercolor pencils, I don't know their durability over time. You know, where oil paints, when it dries, it's like dried paint, boom, done. This watercolor pencil stuff, you know, I don't know how reactivation that level is, by the way, so. I'd have to do some research in that, but um, uh, so Mike says they haven't made a new Master Grade Dom. They have Master Grade Nightingales. Uh, they're high grades. Um, yeah, they're high grades. The, the Nightingale is a there's an RE100, which is a non Master Grade 1100 scale. Uh, a Master Grade kit typically involves the fact that it has an inside frame like a skeleton, um, and then um, the non Master Grade stuff, like a, a regular high grade, tends to be made up of just like uh, multiple parts clamped together and just kind of holding itself together. It's not like armor on top of a skeleton. Uh, so that's kind of the main primary difference in terms of like describing it in layman's terms. Um, the RE100s were like a giant high grade. So they're multiple parts holding itself together. Most of it are two parts that clamp together and stuff like that. So it's a little bit simpler, a little bit less detailed. The master grade experience is a little bit more of a building experience. You know, you build it up from the inside out like a human skeleton and then you put the skin on. So it's a little bit different. Um, there won't be a master grade nightingale because they've just put out a high grade nightingale. So if they're going to do that, that would kill the sales. They probably won't do that. Um, and then the real grades are, are 1144 scale master grades. They're small, one, smaller scale with an inner frame and all that stuff too. Um, but yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool though. I mean, I have to admit, that's kind of neat looking. I can't lie. I like that. I don't dislike it. Even for the colors I had to choose. Um, but I was kind of doing a pale green on top of an army green a little bit, you know, if that because I, I know enough Russian art You could almost believe this is a t-55 turret or something like that. So we'll see it's kind of I kind of like that. There's something there something there uh, They're they're definitely um, The process is pretty basic a little dip in the water a little application on the model a little blend with the brush It's it's the same principles. So I like that um, ooh, Okay, 4.7 magnitude. That's pretty solid. Anything over 4, you're going to feel. Yeah, 5 and above is a little bit on the danger scale, but 4.7 magnitude, yeah. But it's only 100 miles away, but yeah, I'm sure your little island rock didn't roll there. Uh, what else we got here? Um, glad you guys enjoyed my video so much. Pandermeister36, thank you for your answer, Evan, yesterday on the interior. Um, if you guys didn't see that, his comment um, yesterday that... Um, uh, what were we talking about? Interiors of 1940-41-ish uh, German armor. Uh, Evan came back with his well-researched uh, deal. Gave you an answer there yesterday. So if you want to see the answer yesterday on terms of interior wall colors of the Stug 3B, uh, Evan gave a nice answer in the comments on the previous stream. Uh, Tristan, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, we covered some ground today. It seemed to go pretty smooth. We're pretty far in. Longer episode tonight, three and a half hours. Um, got a little pencil work in for you. Um, so that's that's kind of cool. Again, uh, we hit a lot of you know the different dust conversations. Even fixed a big f up, <laughs> showed you how to do that. Um, the T thirty four work. Uh, this this is pretty cool. A lot of lot of different stuff going on that um, came out pretty cool. I actually really like that. Um, pretty. Neat. What else? Got the tire. Put a little just on just basic dust applications. So hopefully that hopefully that reinforces um, the dust application with the pigments and then the, the airbrush fixer. It's keep it simple. Don't sweat it out. You know, put it down and, and commit to it a little bit too. Uh, you know, keep, to get that that kind of contrast. But my my uh, things are dying. So, uh, all right, guys, uh, I am out of here tonight. Um, you'll see with the flat coat and lose it all. Uh, it blends well together. One coat. Okay, cool. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I'm losing my headset, so I'm gonna probably it's probably gonna get a reverb on the mic here in a sec. Uh, might suck. But anywho, guys, I'm going to bounce. We're good. Everybody good? I'll answer any questions I missed in the comments later on tomorrow. 
Um, thank you guys for hanging in there. Really appreciate it. Uh, everybody have a great day wherever it was. Wednesday, have a great Thursday. Uh, and then we'll see you Sunday. All right. Good night, guys. See ya.